Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, here in the audience this evening, and those following along um, either on the television or on Zoom at home. Um, we are going to call to order the March 20, 2023 meeting of the San Carlos Planning and Transportation Commission. Um, before we start with our agenda items, we have um, one, uh, one item regarding Assembly Bill 2449 teleconference requests. So I'll turn it over to staff. Thank you, Chair Iacopone. Um, Commissioner Ellen Garvey is joining us remotely this evening pursuant to AB 2449 under Just Cause. So Commissioner Garvey, just a reminder, if at any time there's an individual over the age of 18 present at your remote location, you will need to disclose that and the general nature of your relationship with such individual prior to any action being taken. Uh, and there's one other requirement under AB 2449 that Commissioner Garvey generally described without disclosing her, her personal information the reason for the request. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and if I may ask if Commissioner Garvey heard that. And are you able to unmute or do we need to do that? Commissioner Garvey, can you hear us? She's trying to talk. Mm. Why isn't it working? She, you need to unmute the just bear with us just a moment. There's a lot of technology at play. <laughs> Commissioner Garvey, let's try this one more time and see if we can hear you. All right, can you hear me, Lisa? I can hear you. Perfect, and you were able to hear item number two, AB 2449. No, I hear anything. As soon as Jim said good evening, it cut out, so I have not heard anything. Okay, well, we'll try that again. So we have a new item on our agenda, um, Assembly Bill 2449. <laughs> And this is um, in play whenever a commissioner decides to join us remotely. So pursuant to AB 2449, um, Commissioner Garvey is joining us this evening under the just cause category. And Commissioner Garvey, so that you can hear us this time, um, as a reminder, if at any time there's an individual over the age of 18 present at your remote location, you'll need to disclose that to staff and the general nature of your relationship with such individual prior to any action being taken. And if I may ask the city attorney to repeat the additional. Um, yeah, under the under the this really uh, this new law, we, um, you, Commissioner Garvey, you also need to. Describe which one of the four just cause reasons without needing to disclose any personal information. And through the chair, we realize that there's some feedback, and we'll try to correct that as we move along here. Yeah. Let us proceed with um, Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll correct this. We still need to finish on, on AB. There's a, there's a requirement that there be a disclosure. Um, at Commissioner Garvey, I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you, okay. yes. I didn't know if you wanted me to, to speak yeah, I, it's, now. We, yeah, we need to do it before we convene the meeting. Okay, yeah. all right. Yes, I'm, I'm participating remotely because I had a medical procedure on my foot and I'm not cleared to walk or drive yet. It, that would be, I think, the the medical disability <laughs> I, one of, of AB 2449 under just cause. Okay, we're complete with that item now, and we'll move on to Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, very good. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, United States of America, the Republic. Chair, if I can take a moment to see if we can fix the feedback.
I wonder if it's helpful for me to be on mute unless I'm speaking. Is is the feedback coming from me? No, I didn't hear any. But it, when, when we speak in the room, it, you hear it. Lisa, you may need to mute your present computer. Through the chair, can we take a uh, like a five to ten minute break? Yes, please. Um, we will reconvene at uh, uh, seven fifteen. Sure. Yeah. It sounds like this. Can you hear the echo? There's a Testing one, two, three. That sounds normal, but I Commissioner Garvey, can you hear me? 
Commissioner Garvey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, it doesn't seem to be doing it now. It is. Is it? Oh, yes, there is. How about you don't use this? For the broadcasting. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. I mean, it's, it's just distracting, here. if anything. Um, and can you test on yours, Andrea, and to see if there's an echo? Yeah, you could always just use this one, right? Yeah. Test, test, test. There's a little there's, bit there's of a feedback. feedback. It's, yes. Yeah, Is that just something we're going to have to live with? I need to sit here. I'm running the show. Yeah, no, I can't. Let's see if we can. Testing one, two, three. Is that better? Is that better? I think so. Yeah. There's no feedback. Commissioner Garvey, you're able to hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Yeah. We just killed the whole Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. It is 7.15, and I think, hopefully, crossing fingers, we resolve the issue. Excellent. Um, so maybe before, uh, we're going to uh, reconvene, and uh, thank you to everyone who is online for their patience as we uh, try this um, new meeting format for the first time, and um, I think we'll go to roll call. Commissioner Castaneda. Present. Commissioner Roof. Present. Commissioner Garvey? Present. Vice Chair Clements? Present. And Chair Iacopone? Present. Um, next item, item five on our agenda is a public comment. This is the opportunity for uh, members of the public to um, speak and re, uh, share their thoughts on uh, items not on the agenda this evening. The commission may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed as allowed by the Brown Act, Government Code Section 54954.2. However, the commission's general policy is to refer items to staff for attention or have a matter placed on a future commission agenda for a more comprehensive action or report. Um, I don't know that we have any speaker cards here in the audience. I don't believe so for public comment. Anyone have anything? No? Okay. And um, Lynette, uh, if you're back 
uh, monitoring, are there any hands raised or anyone requesting to speak at public comment? Uh, currently, there are no hand raised. Very good, thank you. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll s assume that there are no persons requesting to make a public comment at this time. Very good, item six, approval of minutes from the Planning and Transportation Commission meeting of March 6. Uh, so to fellow commissioners, have you any comments or uh, clarifications on the minutes? Um, Commissioner Roof? Yeah, I, ha I have one, co um, one correction in the, um, in the biosafety um, resolution um, area. At the, towards the end, right before the, the motion, where it says, Commissioner Roof shared that he believes San Carlos is the first city, and then I would like to have inserted uh, what I think I said at the time, in San Mateo County, to bring biosafety labs under land use purview. Good, thank you. Um, Commissioner Castaneda, and it's uh, Vice Chair Clements. Thanks, Chair. I don't have any corrections or amendments, but I was gonna move approval of the minutes from the Planning and Transportation Commission meeting of March 6th, 2023, with the amendment offered by Commissioner Roof. Thank you, I'll second. Commissioner Castaneda? Yes. Commissioner Roof? Yes. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Iacopone? Yes. Very good. Uh, we're now on item seven, public hearing. Um, we have uh, two items tonight. And the procedure for public hearing, staff will present a report on the history, physical features, et cetera, of an application followed with the staff's recommendations. The applicant may also make a presentation. And thereafter, interested members of the community may speak on the proposal. When all interested parties have had the opportunity to be heard, the hearing will be closed, and no further discussion from the floor can be held. The commission will then consider the evidence and make its recommendation. If you challenge a public hearing item in court, you may be limited to only raising those issues you or someone else raised at the public hearing described in this notice, the public notice, or in the written correspondence delivered to the city at or prior to the public hearing. Um, speakers should state their name prior to addressing the commission. This uh, always helps staff in preparing the minutes for the evening. So our first um, agenda item tonight is a property at 888 Branston. <laughs> It's APNs 046-100-060, 270, and 280. And the items for consideration are request for design review, transportation demand management plan, conditional use permit, tree removal certificate, and grading and dirt hauling permit for the development of a new 105,416 square foot research and development life science building. And with that, we'll turn it to staff for presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name, and hello, Planning and Transportation Commission. Um, my name is Jake Garcia. I'm a consultant planner for the city of San Carlos. And the item before you tonight, oh, is the uh, PowerPoint going? Is there a way that I can tell? Oh, okay, I have control, thank you. Uh, the item before you tonight is a request for consideration for a design review, grading and dirt hall certificate, a conditional use permit, tree removal certificate, and a transportation demand management plan for, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for a new research and development life science building at 888 Branston Road. The subject site consists of three lots. 2.42 acres in size that currently contains three single story buildings and, this, uh, and the associated surface parking used for office, industrial, and research and development. The site is located in the general commercial industrial zoning district and general plan land use designation. <clears throat> Since it is located, um, or excuse me, the subject site, um, 
pardon me. Um, the census located in the East Side Innovation District and detailed further in the staff report and attachments, the project features elements that are aligned with the East Side Innovation District vision plan, including uh, goal one, to establish an industrial road as a green boulevard. The project dedicates a 25 foot easement along the industrial road public right of way for the purpose of open space, includes a wide walkway, street lighting, benches, and landscape being for public use. In goal two, to establish an open space network for the project, um, it pr the project proposes drought tolerant plantings, it increases the overall uh, tree canopy by proposing to plant 55 new trees on site and along the public right of way. Goal five, which is to support distinct district sub areas. The project proposes superior quality of architecture and urban design, including the placement of the proposed building close to the street along Branston Road to create a street wall framing the public realm and is further complemented by landscaping and lighting. In goal nine, which is to reduce congestion through transportation strategies, the project includes a transportation management plan to reduce vehicle trip generation by at least 20% and incorporates a shared parking agreement with 845 Branston Road, which is the parking garage across the street, and that will be discussed further later, further in this, um, excuse me, that will be discussed later in this presentation. The applicant proposes to construct a new 105,416 square foot research and development life science building with three floors, surface level parking, and landscape improvements. Entitlements include design review, grading and dirt hall certificate, conditional use permit for building height, tree removal certificate, and adoption of a uh, transportation demand management plan. Starting first with the design review, this is a, the view of the building frontage along Branston Road and is of a similar design to the buildings across the street on Branston Road as well, which are known as 825 and 835 Industrial Road. This project is owned and proposed by the same applicant. Large glass windows are utilized throughout the proposed building for a modern design uh, and to minimize mass and bulk. The building facades along Branston Road, Industrial Road, um, and Highway 101 features metal, glass, concrete, and composite finishes and are similar to the character of the industrial uses in the area. Large accent walls consist of warm natural palettes or colors to provide a variety in exterior uh, materials and break up massing created by the large glass windows. Here's another view of the, uh, just a moment. I'm not having much control on this remote. Do I have to point at anything? Uh, through the chair, I think we need to take another break. Maybe five minutes. Very good. We'll have a, take a five minute recess then, please.
Uh, we'll give Lynette just a second to get back. Lynette, let us know when you're back. I think we are back live. Very good. So, um, Matt, again, can you confirm that our slide is presenting accurately? Can you just remove one slide just for testing? Yes, it's moving. Excellent. And um, Ellen, are you able to hear us? Yes, I am, and I Very can good. see the slides. Good, and we can hear you as well. Thank you. Uh, Jake, back to you. Great, thank you. Um, picking up where we left off, we were talking about the design of the building, um, and we had just run through uh, this front elevation rendering, and moving on to the next uh, rendering. This is the uh, another view of the front of the building closer to the entrance portal along Branston Road. And our next slide shows the building from the back of the building and the side of the building that is along Industrial Road. So you'll see the parking lot in the back and that uh, dedicated easement along Industrial Road um, rendering with landscape plantings. And here's another view, but from the rear of the building showing more of the back parking lot. Uh, here's the proposed site plan. Uh, the building is proposed centrally along Branston Road and is surrounded by a surface uh, parking lot of 86 parking spaces, as well as a private open space area abutting the building and a public open space area along Industrial Road. The main building entrance fronts Branston Road and a secondary building entrance is located at the rear of the building uh, facing the surface parking lot. The applicant provides adequate landscaping around the perimeter of the building. Approximately 21,138 square feet of landscaping is proposed, where 10,541 square feet is required. The landscape plan includes street planting, raised planters, raised biotreatment, and planting areas. Uh, landscape amenities include low landscape walls for seating um, and lighting accessible to the public um, along Industrial Road. There are proposed tables and chairs accessible to employees outside the south and west of the building in the private outdoor amenity areas. And to orient you, uh, <clears throat> those, you'll see those on the site plan at the rear of the building um, and along the side closest to Industrial Road. The project applicant requests approval of a conditional use permit to allow multiple structures to exceed the maximum height, coverage, and setback pursuant to municipal 18.56060, um, and these structures are on the roof. This would include an exception to the setbacks of design features and the stair towers located on the, on the roof. A setback of one foot for every foot of projection above the height limit is required for design features and stair towers. The applicant requests no setback for the cornices where one foot would be required and no setback for the entry portal, east stair tower and accent wall at the west stair tower where 10 feet would be required. Uh, the request for exceptions to the rooftop setbacks um, is to enhance the overall design of the project. And the uh, request is also for an increased maximum height for the proposed exhaust stack uh, to be 22.89 feet above the max building height uh, for an air handling unit and a 10 point, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. 22.89 feet above the max building height where eight feet is allowed. The applicant indicates the reason for the request is uh, to allow the lab exhaust to disperse at a higher elevation for health and safety purposes. And the applicant requests an increased maximum height for the proposed mechanical equipment to be 12.22 feet above the uh, maximum building height for an air handling unit and 10.89 feet above the maximum building height for the hydronic accessories where eight feet is normally allowed for rooftop of mechanical equipment. The applicant indicates that the reason for the request is to accommodate the height of these necessary rooftop equipments. And here's a different perspective showing the roof plan and rooftop features. A rooftop feature shaded in red are the features requesting approval for the CUP tonight. And <clears throat> the applicant is requesting to remove a total of seven trees, um, six of which are significant. These include two California fan palms um, and four strawberry trees. 
Um, all seven of the trees are for proposed for removal. Are they are located fully or partially in the footprint of the proposed development? And the seven trees are labeled in red on the screen. You'll see the proposed plantings of other trees um, indicated by the gray circles throughout the site plan. Uh, the applicant is required to plant at least eight trees and is proposing to plant 55 on-site trees. Moving on to the grading and dirt hall certificate. Planning commission approval is required when grading exceeds 1,000 uh, cubic yards of grading. The project proposes uh, site grading of 4,900 cubic yards of soil movement to construct the building above the natural grade to mitigate for future flooding and sea level concerns. And results in an estimated 800 truckloads to import infill and is uh, to occur through the course of construction. Uh, grading operations will follow the recommendations of the geotechnical report and um, the hall routes associated with the grading and dirt hall um, are on your screen and show routes that uh, leave the site to go to the 101 north and south and an alternative route for the, the north um, using a south uh, entrance. The applicant's transportation demand management plan um, was prepared by Ferry and Pierce and anticipates at least a 20% reduction in trips based on the measures listed here. And uh, regarding CEQA, an initial study mitigated neg negative declaration uh, has been prepared. Uh, this is also known as ISMND. Uh, it was prepared by Lamphere Gregory uh, pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA, and the CEQA guidelines to identify any um, potentially significant environmental uh, effects associated with the project. The initial study identified some uh, effects that could result from the project related to air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, hazardous and hazardous materials. Since the initial study concluded, um, these impacts could be, uh, that these impacts could be mitigated at a level of significance, uh, of, in, of insignificance, excuse me, uh, mitigated ne negative declaration was prepared and the recommended mitigation measures as follows. For air quality, uh, mitigation measures to reduce potential uh, uh, dust and construction equipment exhaust during construction activities, including watering exposed surfaces, covering truck loads and proper maintenance of construction equipment. Mitigation measures for biological resources include reduction of potential impacts to nesting and migratory birds by uh, including the timing of construction uh, of construction or pre-construction surveys. For cultural resources, mitigation measures implementing protocols to be instituted in the event of archeological resources or human remains being found during construction. And for hazardous and hazardous materials, Mitigation measures uh, recommended requiring the preparation and implementation of a site management plan and health and safety plan to prevent impacts in the event that contaminant soil or groundwater are encountered. Uh, this project has been adequately noticed. The public notice was mailed to all property owners and occupants within 300 feet of the site on March 7, 2023 and published in the newspaper on March 9, 2023. One comment has been received since the publication of the staff report. And finally, on your screen is the recommended action should you, approve, should you decide to approve the project. Uh, this concludes staff presentation. Both staff and the applicant team are available for any questions that the Planning and Transportation Committee may have tonight. Thank you. Very good, thank you for a presentation. Um, does the applicant have a presentation or anything to add this evening? Good evening, um, Chair Yagopani, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. My name is Teresia Nemeth. I'm with Alexandria Real Estate Equities, Inc. We um, developed, own, and operate the facilities at 825-835 Industrial Road across the street from this site. Um, we have been in San Carlos for quite some time. We're pleased that when we purchased uh, the 888 Branston facility from the prior owner, we evaluated the project that they had 
uh, submitted to the planning department and determined uh, in discussions with the neighborhood that it was not advisable to build such a large building at that location as it's that much closer to the Greater East San Carlos community. So we chose to redesign it and bring back to you a project that is in general compliant with zoning, except for these minor issues that relate to the um, equipment on the roof. So just wanted to let you know that uh, we are here to answer any questions you have, and our architect, Niall Malcolmson of Dowder Grumman Architects is here to present the design. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners, planning staff, and city attorney. So let's see, I would like to go to Um, let's see, I'd like to start with page 15. The sheet number is in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, it'll be the sheet number 15. It might not be the page number. So just <clears throat> talk briefly about the, the design, the materials, and the, the quality of the materials. So as a companion or a little brother or a little sister to the 825, 835 buildings, we have selected exterior wall elements from that project. So what you're seeing here on the, the west and south side of the building this is a glass curtain wall with a projecting horizontal fin for solar control. That's one of the elements from the 825, 835. Um, we have a sort of a copper colored metal panel that we use as the entry portal and at the stair features. And you're also seeing um, what was a condition of approval, which is the roof screen um, would be made with that same metal panel. It's compatible with a metal panel system that's on 825, 835, um, but a little less industrial. It's a nicer product. Um, then if you could go to page 19. There we go. So this is kind of a zoomed in view of the entry portal. And here you're seeing the other um, facade system, which is a, a simple glass and vertical mullion system, and the mullions are staggered from floor to floor to create some interest. So that's the other element we brought from the 825, 835. Um, Jacob has already covered compliance with the East Side Innovation District, but I'll just touch on a couple of other things. So um, if you could go to, let's see. I'll try to keep this at a minimum, uh, sheet 14. So one of, the, one of the items under environmental stewardship was designing for sea level rise and flood mitigation. So um, this building is designed, has a finished floor elevation of 13.6 feet. The base flood elevation in this vicinity is 10 feet. Um, the buildings across the street that Alexandria constructed a couple of years ago were designed to a flood elevation of 12 feet. Um, the same civil engineer is now recommending we increase that for a, a event threshold um, in 2050. So we have raised the building an additional 18 inches. So that creates um, some distance up from the curb and also contributes to the importing of fill. So um, let's see. Why don't we look at, if you could go to sheet 17. So one of the other bullet points from the Eastside Innovation District Vision Plan was the support 
um, district sub areas. And it talks about the superior quality and the urban architecture. So this, this is a very compatible and high quality building. Um, and it's, it's also under that same bullet point. Um, we're within the base zone, which is 50 feet, which is encouraged in the vision plan. Um, if you could go to sheet 15, we'll talk about the activity hub. So this, we're putting in a segment of the double tree lined boulevard on the east side of Industrial Road. And we've also dedicated, um, to make that more of an activity zone, we've, we've dedicated a, a small pocket park with seating and um, some benches there. Um, there's also some private seating areas adjacent to that and behind the building. Um, and let's see, I think one of the bigger ones would be if you could go all the way back to sheet four. Um, <coughs> objective number nine from the vision plan is to reduce congestion through coordinated transportation. Um, we're fortunate that there was a surplus of parking in 825, 835. So we're actually only providing 85, 86 spaces on site and 194 spaces will be in the existing garage. So that's a, a win for both projects. Um, let's see. Um, then in, in regards to the roof screen, which we have just recently added to this set. It wasn't in our original submittal until we found out it was going to be a condition of approval. And that shows up in several instances. So if you could start on sheet nine, and you'll see there's gonna be, okay, so this, this is the initial design. And if you go down one page, um, we're, we've indicated where the roof screen is, so the roof screen is now encircling the rooftop equipment, um, so it has closure on the Project North and Project South facing Branston. Um, we did not close it on the east. Um, the, the comment was to provide um, screening for a majority of the equipment as seen from different points within the community, so um, that was our proposal. Um, so this, this also shows up on sheet 11. Yes, so this is, this is without the roof screen and if you go to the next sheet, you'll see with the roof screen how most of that equipment is obscured except for the exhaust fans, which need to extend up to disperse the exhaust at a high velocity. Um, and then on sheet 12, we'll see the, the back side of the building and the side facing industrial. So this is before the roof screen. And on the next sheet, you'll see with the roof screen. And on sheet 13, we'll just walk around the building. Oh, this is the line of sight. So here, um, we, we satisfied the line of sight as codified um, without the roof screen, but um, this is just showing how that looks with the roof screen. And then just a couple more, page 15. This is as it was submitted, and the next sheet will show what that looks like with the added roof screen. Page 16 will be the alternate view as submitted and with the added roof screen on the next sheet. And finally on page 18, we've got two views. Yep, so this is the, the north side of the building as submitted and next sheet will be with the roof screen. Okay. Yeah, any questions about the design or anything I haven't touched on that you're curious about? Thank you very much for, um, to both of you for your presentations. Um, I suggest maybe we'll start uh, this evening with uh, Commissioner Garvey um, and uh, to check if you have any questions for the applicants or clarifying questions from staff, Alan. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you uh, to the presenters for that presentation. I had two questions. I think all this rain has got me thinking of water. Can you point out where the bioretention ponds are? Are these located in the front, like where the where the parklet is, or are they located in, ver in more than one side of the building? I did read about them in the packets, and I couldn't find them located on a drawing. Okay, so those are actually going to be in the civil sheets. We'll need to go back a little bit. The biofiltration is predominantly at the perimeter of the site. So we're shedding water to the east um, along 101 and to the north. Um, and that's also a function of having raised the site three and a half feet. So the building is a high point, everything's shedding away. We do have some filtration um, on the west side of the building as well. Thank you, that's helpful. And it makes sense that it would be away from the building since you're elevated three and a half feet. My second and final question relates to the ride share drop off zone. I couldn't tell from the drawings where that was. Do you envision the ride share drop off is along industrial or along Branston near the front door of the of the building? Can you help me understand that better? Yeah, I think that would be best uh, along Branston near near the main entry. That makes sense. Yep. That then 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 having it on industrial. Thanks right. for that clarification. And Chair Yakaponi, those are all of my questions. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Garvey. Um, Commissioner Roof. Thank you for a nice overview. And um, first, I wanted to say that having the added roof screen, working with the city to put that in, is I think a really uh, nice feature for the city because the uh, city gradually rises up to a higher elevation, and you can see the uh, tops of these buildings, um, even though it's from a distance. So it may not impact much from the immediate sidewalk, but it certainly impacts from a little further back. Mm -hmm. So that's a great thing. Um, I hope all the future projects also uh, have to do that sort of thing. Uh, I have a question about the uh, transportation demand management, uh, which is, I'm, I'm concerned, and I think the community, is, with the greater impact of traffic on uh, in the area, and whether that um, plan takes into account uh, the other new developments that are going up and the potential impact um, on the um, Holly and Industrial Road uh, intersection, for instance. Um, so I'm just not sure if the scope of the TDM uh, addresses the larger impact. I appreciate the question, Commissioner. Um, we do have a shuttle program that we are operating currently in the A25835 project, and it's very successful and, and doing quite well, and we intend to incorporate this building into that combined system, so it should work very, uh, very cohesively. And in the future, I believe the city is working and we are supporting their effort to develop a transportation management association that would leverage those kinds of services to more of the kinds of buildings that are being built here. And a follow-up question on the, uh, that. The intersection of Branston and Industrial, that's just a stop sign on Branston? No, it, or no it's, it's a signalized, signalized oh, intersection. It's, it's a signal light now? Yes, okay. it is. Okay, that, that's safer. Good. That's all for, for, for the moment. Good, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Clements, I think you had your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just had a couple of questions. One, um, I think the building is very attractive. Uh, would the exterior material around the roofing screen match the um, the exterior material on the full height elevation in the entryway? Yes, it'll be the same metal panel system that we have at the entry portal and also at the stair features at the east and west. Great, thank you. Um, Given the large amount of glass on the exterior, although I, I realize it's cut up by vertical ribs, um, is the building considered to be bird safe? I saw only a, a fleeting mention of birds in the EIR. I'd have to defer if that was um, a requirement. Not clear if it's a requirement, just wondering if that has attributes that would make it bird safe. Yeah, so one of the things is it is only a three-story building, so it's not nearly as concerning as taller buildings where birds are flying up into it. Mm -hmm. So with the trees that are 
in the parking lot and all around the building, we feel that's gonna block it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the heightened ducting and why it's needed on the roof? Is there a particular type of use that would go on in the building that requires that heightened? Yes. Um, this, is, this is proposed to be a research and development building that will have labs, um, primarily biology, but there could be some chemistry. Mm -hmm. And the, the fumes hoods in the chemistry labs need to be exhausted at a high velocity so that they're dispersed into the atmosphere. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just had one more question. Um, I don't know if there's a question for staff or the applicant. Um, if you could remind us who is responsible for carrying out the TDM plan. I realize that Alexandria as the applicant presents the TDM plan, but that you might lease the space. Um, and some of the uh, some of the items under control um, listed in the TDM plan, you know, like telecommuting, um, is really under the control of the of the lessee. So, or is it lessor? <laughs> so, I'm just wondering again how that responsibility falls. It sounds like it's a mix because you're running a shuttle program. Right, so I, I think the, the answer to the question is it depends if this is a multi-tenant building okay. or if it's a single tenant building. At 105,000 square feet, it's possible that it would be leased to a single tenant. And so at that point, those obligations would transfer to the tenant in whole. Okay. But if it was as 825835 is, which is a multi-tenant facility, then we continue to operate it. And we do pass on a lot of responsibilities through our leases nice. to provide information and to support that effort. Right, great, thank you for that information. That's all I have, Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, Commissioner Castaneda. I also had a question about the glass. Um, at, at least, can you address the, the glare issue? I mean, is it low glare glass yes. that you're using? Yes. Based on that. Mm -hmm. And then I, I'd like a little more information. I didn't quite understand the, the two setback omissions on the uh, stairs going up to the towers, if you could explain that a little more. I didn't quite get that. There's a sheet that has that pretty well detailed. Um, it would be sheet 10 that shows all of the roof height exemptions. There's a little diagram on the side there that indicates. Um, so the diagrammatic section on the right-hand side of the page shows that little red zone. So the, the way the code is written for elements that are exceeding the height limit, they have to set back one foot horizontally for every foot vertically. So what we're seeking for the stairs and the entry portal is just approval of that little red triangle, okay. not, not the portal as a whole. Okay. And you can, and it's actually indicated how many square feet on the plan, like the portal, 730 square feet that are not in compliance. Yes. So the, the intention is to, to create an element that expresses a little something more than just a standard um, industrial building. It kind of gives a little accent, but it's not a big facility. Okay. And the only other comment that I have is that I, I do think that the uh, guard that you're putting around the equipment on the top is a, a must, and it's attractive. It's been done pretty well, I think. That's very nice. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. After, after you, if you were gonna. Go ahead. Oh, my, is, is this building uh, landscaping connected into the gray water system that I've heard of for other buildings in the area? Not familiar with the gray water system. There was, the, what are they, it's a different color pipe. Uh, it's water the purple system. pipe. Purple pipe, yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Collecting like water from sinks and, and, and reusing that for irrigation, right? Thanks. Um, just a couple for me. Um, the fire lane at off of industrial, is that open? Is, is it open to free flow of traffic? No, there's a gate and a card access key for the fire department. They require two points of access to a building of this size and height. 
So the, the, end, the entry at the end of the cul-de-sac was not enough. They needed a secondary point of entry. I, I um, was pleased to see the second point, and I'm glad to know that um, there is a way to discourage people from using that as their primary entrance and uh, exit from the parking. So, so good. Um, maybe a question for, um, for staff. Um, the, uh, in the uh, mitigation measures regarding groundwater uh, and soil, how will the city know that soil contamination during construction or groundwater contamination during construction was found? Um, like, who's checking um, how often and so that actually something could be done about it? Yeah, so um, during construction, the, the contractor during the grading will actually test the, so the soil and will report if any um, contamination was found to the responsible agency, and then that agency will ensure that the proper handling is taken care of. Um, and this applicant has experience with that at a similar project where some additional contamination was found and they were able to properly remediate it. Okay, good. And, and you know, the reason for raising it is that um, are the local community and uh, has flagged this regularly that this is an area with past industrial use and it would be good to know that the city is um, watching out for uh, compliance with this element. So will the city engineer also be checking? I mean, is this something that's on their normal list of things when they stop by a project? Um, they do not typically, I don't believe, check for that. It's through the responsible agency, which I think in this case is the County Environmental Health. Okay, but uh, I guess, sorry, Elisa. The regional the, the, water, sorry, it's the Regional Water Con yeah. Quality Control Board. Thank you. But it requires <laughs> self-reporting. I think that's the key thing. There is not a follow-up check by the city. Not by the city, but by the Regional Water Quality Control okay. Board. They do come out. Yes. Good, that, thanks, that helps. Um, n no further questions for me. Let's just uh, check one more time before we um, open it up to public comment. Commissioner Garvey, any anything else? No additional questions. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Okay, very good. Um, thank you for your presentation and uh, answering our questions. I uh, will now turn it over to uh, public comment. Um, Lenard, I think... Uh, since there are no hands raised here, uh, it'll be over to you for uh, to help us work through the people who might want to make a comment that are online. Yes, um, the first caller is Sam. Thank you and uh, welcome and uh, good evening. And uh, you have two minutes, please. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. <clears throat> Thank you for the ability to comment. I'm sorry I'm sick, so I'm, my voice is a little froggy. Um, I'm, I have a few questions. I apologize if, if, if I missed the presentation, some of the answers to these questions, but I'm curious what the exhaust is coming from these smokestacks and um, the, you know whether or not the public should be concerned about what's being emitted. I'm concerned about uh, the height of the smokestacks given the proximity to the airport. And I'd like to make sure that the San Carlos airport is comfortable with the height. Um, I, I do believe that, <clears throat> excuse me, purple pipe should be provided, anticipating that recycled water from the, the Redwood City wastewater system in Red, in which, which also takes the San Carlos wastewater and then would recycles it there's a reason why Redwood Shores look so green. It's because they used recycled water for their landscaping and St. Carlos in the East Side Innovation District strives to do that as well. So purple pipes should be included in this design for, for watering the plants, the 50 trees proposed for planting. Um, would also like to make sure that no class three or higher met biotech labs are pr proposed here. I haven't heard clarification on that. Um, I would also like to make sure that 
Similar light mitigation on the windows as 405 industrial is done at this site so that there's not light pollution emitting into the neighborhood. <clears throat> and I'm curious if the same community mitigations like 405 industrial will be required here. And I don't see why they should not be in the same proportion. Thank you. Uh, one other comment is that um, I do believe that the city should be involved if there are toxics found on site to make sure that remediation of all toxics occurs and not the capping of the site with leaving the toxics in the ground. That's very important to the community because this is a once in a lifetime chance to clean up the mess, which otherwise is least leaching into the groundwater of the San Francisco Bay, which is as sea level rise happens, will affect us all as water backs up. Thank you. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, could I could I ask the applicant to maybe address a couple of these points, please? Did you did you jot them down? Would you mind sharing a few points back? I think um, exhaust. Could you just comment on the exhaust? I, I think the first comment on the exhaust was about what it is. Um, so it's going to be um, very diluted uh, fumes from the chemical fume hoods in the building. Um, and that's all regulated and is in accordance with state, federal, and local laws. Um, the question of the height of the exhaust, um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the lab exhaust fans are intentionally taller to eject at a high velocity and have a, a very good dispersion into the atmosphere. And I, I think that the caller's question, um, and it was a good one, was did, did we check with the airport? I don't know that this is within the airport zone, but is it, do they have any point of view? I believe not because we're half the height of the buildings next door that also have similar exhaust stacks on okay, their roof. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and purple pipe? Purple pipe, um, that was something that was not integrated into the design. Just the, the quantity of water that we would get out of that system wouldn't justify the cost for a building of this size. Yeah. Um, biosafety lab level three, I, I think the... The answer to that question is, at this point, we do not have a tenant for this building. We don't know what type of work they'll be doing in that building at that point in time when tenant improvement plans are brought forward for approval. That would be when that would be discussed, and we would we are cognizant that the city is considering um, ordinance, and we would, at that point, follow whatever ordinance is in place. Great. Thank you. And then maybe last, there was a, a question about um, light pollution, light pollution and uh, glare. Or yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we we do have um, low glare glass for reflected light. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of light pollution in the evenings from these buildings. Um, and there were two comments on environmental mitigation and removal of toxins that are out of my expertise. So. Good, thank you very much. Um, Lynette, could we uh, maybe go to the next caller? Yes, next caller is Gary and Debbie. Very good. Um, uh, Gary and Debbie, uh, who's up first? Hello, it's just Debbie tonight. Good evening, Debbie, I'm welcome, on. and uh, you have two minutes, please. Thank you, good evening. We live on the west side, and I am retired. I'm not a member of any group or organization, and I'm speaking as a person who worked in the medical industry. I was a nurse for years in my first career, and I'm very concerned about the number of high containment biosafety labs being planned in San Carlos. Alexandria is particularly non-transparent with what they're going to do in the buildings and what kind of research is going to be done. Gary and I met with Terezia Nemeth about a year ago. She would not even disclose whether there was animal experimentation on site, citing tenant confidentiality. The one way the public can learn 
whether high containment labs are planned is to look at the height exceptions requested. When you see a 23 foot tall exhaust tower on uh, exhaust stacks on the top of the building, and there are four of them, that tells you that that building is being planned for BSL three or four use. And they should have to disclose that whether they have a tenant or not. On the East Coast, this is required around Cambridge in many communities. In addition, that kind of equipment on the roof is often enclosed in soundproofing containing walls called penthouses because this close to the east side neighborhood is going to emit a lot of noise at night and there's no soundproofing and it could even be worse by the vibration from the metal railing around it. So we request that the city require developers to disclose the biosafety levels at the time they build the buildings and not defer and obfuscate when the tenants come in there because it's no longer a lack of transparency transparency it's active concealment thank you thank you for your comments debbie um lynette our next caller please next caller is jeff molly uh, good evening jeff welcome thank you for joining us um you have two minutes please awesome thank you uh, thank you for letting me uh, have the time to speak and uh, i certainly appreciated the presentation I actually, as it turns out, I'm just going to be echoing what other people have already said. Um, I did want to raise, again, another concern about the smokestacks. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, Jeff, sorry. Can you um, get a little closer to the mic so that everyone sure. can hear you well? Thank you. Is this any better? Try again. Is this any better or no? Yes, let's say yes. Okay. I guess I needed a headset. Anyway, I just wanted to echo uh, some of the concerns again about the smokestacks and what is going to be emitted by them. Um, while I, I, I take the point about it being sent high into the atmosphere, you know, particulates will eventually come down. Um, and to, uh, to Debbie's point, um, you know, if there is going to be a BSL-3 lab there, uh, that's, that's very concerning for those of us who live you know, within visual distance of it. Um, I'm a little concerned that we're not getting a straight answer as to whether or not that's planned. I'm assuming if the building is going to be built it's either going to support a BSL-3 lab or it isn't. So I feel like that's a known quantity before construction even begins. So this this comes across to me as a resident as if, you know, the, you know there's some evasiveness going on. You know, it's either intended or it isn't. Uh, and then the other last concern I have is just, you know, another building on, on industrial. Uh, you know, I'm a little concerned about uh, increased traffic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for your comments here this evening. Um, Lynette, um, do we have a next caller? Yes, uh, next caller is Dimitri. Very good. Uh, good evening, Dimitri. Welcome, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, you have two minutes, please. Yes, hi. Can you can you folks hear me? Yes, well. Okay, great. Um, a couple of things. Um, it would be great if you guys could put up the, some of the architectural uh, representations, the, the 3D uh, that I could make my points a little more clear clearly. Um, a couple of things. Um, I, I really do like the uh, landscaping plan. I think there's a significant amount of trees, and I like that front park area. Um, those are those are positives. Um, and um, I won't comment on on, on the aesthetics, um, but uh, the the one uh, overriding issue that I have are uh, the smokestacks. Um, going up the 23 feet, and I understand that Alexandria's, you know, put, putting in that, uh, whatever you call it, that screening, but it doesn't hide those smokestacks. And the issue I have with them is that they're, they're positioned closer to the community. Um, and I, what I would prefer is to see those smokestacks uh, closer to the freeway uh and uh uh potentially more south i think they're more or less in the middle of of, of of the of the building so maybe they're not more you know north or south but i, I would much prefer them to be uh, more east um uh for uh the 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 issues that were raised earlier is like if, if there's going to be a noise from them it would make more sense for them to be closer to the freeway and also they would be less visually impacting to our community uh, so those are those are the main comments that I have uh, regarding that. So I'd like to see that changed if at all possible. 
Uh, thank you for uh, sharing, Dimitri. Uh, we appreciate uh, those, those uh, key comments. Uh, Lynette, uh, do we have a next caller? There are no more callers. Okay, going once, going twice. Um, I'll entertain a motion to close public comment. Oh, we, um, oh, sorry. Dimitri just raised his hand again. Can we? Same item. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I, w I, was, I was a little short. I just uh, realized one thing. Um, I think there's a, 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 a lack of participation uh, at this meeting. Uh, and uh, I know the city, you know, they have their guidelines about notification, but not a single member of the GESC board was uh, aware uh, that uh, this project was going to be brought up at tonight's planning commission meeting. Uh, so we didn't have a, an opportunity to let the community know. Um, and I, I do think that um, the city really needs to do a better job of outreach uh, to, to uh, 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 current board members uh, when, um, when our community is, is so impacted, whether or not it's within 300 feet. Uh, there may be a, a board member that's 305 feet away <laughs> from, the, from the development, and then they'll never get... Uh, um, uh, a notice. So uh, I, I don't understand our board has been active for decades. Uh, Dimitri, uh, and, I think and, we've we've got your point and um, okay. I think uh, time's up, but thank you very much. Thanks. Um, um, uh, we, we have, yeah, we have a uh, caller, Sam, who spoke earlier. But his hands is raised. Uh, through the chair, our, our practice is that if they've used their full minutes, then they are considered complete. Thank you. Then we have no more new callers. Very good. My Thank comment was my comment Thank was you. not addressed. Do, do I have a, a motion to um, and, and close the public comment? I move that we close public comment. I second the motion. Commissioner Castaneda? Yes. Commissioner Roof? Yes. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Iacopone? Yes. Uh, commissioners, um, your thoughts? Um, and again, maybe uh, just because she's uh, remote, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Garvey. Thank you, Chair. I actually had two or three questions uh, and then maybe we can circle back around for comments. Two of them are on lights. When I looked through the packet, there was an exterior lamp that's going to be at various locations outside. Um, it's a circular light. It's definitely a down light. My question is, is it also an up light? Uh, to the one of the commenters had a comment about how much light there's going to be. And I couldn't tell from the rendering of the lamp if it's an up light as well as a down light, and, and what happens to these lights in the night? Uh, could you uh, step up and maybe uh, give us some perspective? Yeah, there's a, there's a small down light uh, along some of the pedestrian areas, and that was actually a comment we got to make us more integrated with the 825, 835. They have that fixture. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Okay, thanks for confirming that it's a down light. My second question may also be for you. Uh, because it is a glass building, if it's going to be the lights on in the night, then it's gonna create quite a bit of illumination. I'm wondering um, if it will be fairly dark inside the building, you know, after eight or nine or 10 o'clock at night so that it's not adding so much illumination to the neighborhood. Um, Commissioner, the research and development facilities do operate um, pretty well all hours. Uh, science actually doesn't have nine to five. They even work weekends. But the A25835 buildings that we have in operation today, I've not received any complaints um, about light issues, and I have no reason to believe that this is going to be any worse or any better 
than that. The, the glass is gonna be very similar. We purposely did that for design purposes as well as for how it's gonna perform. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. I've driven by the other buildings at night and they're not unduly illuminated. My third and final question, one of the commenters referred to these as smokestacks. I did not think that any smoke was ever gonna be coming out of any of these four exhaust points. Can the applicant clarify that? Um, that's correct, Commissioner. These are not smokestacks. Um, these are vents and they are exactly the same as the ones that we have in the A25835 building. Um, you really can't see those very well because they are so high up, but they are the same size and they are intended to vent the kinds of chemical experiments that are happening within the building, not dissimilar to what happens in a hospital or a medical facility. Thank you, and uh, Chair Iacopone, that concludes my questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Castaneda. Um, I, no, I don't have any other questions. Uh, I do think that this does meet the east side goals, and I also think that it does meet um, the, um, the uh, industrial, you know, it's, it's, it meets the zoning um, qualifications. I think that I like the shared parking very, very much. I think that's a very good feature. And I think the landscaping is excellent since it's much larger than was even required. Um, I think my questions about the lighting have been answered. And I, of course, like the benches that they're putting along industrial and the sidewalk that they're adding on Branston. I think that's a very good feature. And the roof screening, as I mentioned before. Um, so I think it's consistent with the general plan. Great, thank you. Um, Commissioner Roof, comments, questions, your thoughts? Yeah, my, my thoughts are coming back to the purple pipe, I think that's kind of a miss with 55 trees, that's a fairly substantial landscaping and uh, to be, um, this year it's not an issue, but uh, other years it undoubtedly would be. Um, and so um, I'm disappointed that, that that provision isn't made. It doesn't seem, you have to have piping for the irrigation in any case, and so it's a matter of how it's hooked up. Um, so that, that seems like a miss to me. So. I, it bothers me. Otherwise, the scale of the building is quite a bit smaller than, than it could be. The footprint is smaller, the height. Uh, that gives me um, com quite a bit of comfort in, not, um, you know, in accepting the, um, the small variances that require the conditional use permit on the height issues. Um, and, um, and so I'm, I'm happy that the, um, the developers kind of reassessed that situation and came back with a, um, a a more modest um, building that um, it looks very attractive and um, has nice landscaping. Great, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Clements. Thank you, Chair. A couple of comments. Um, actually, Commissioner Garvey's questions about lighting were some of mine, so thank you for answering those. Um, I'd like to commend the applicant on greatly exceeding the tree requirements. I think that's going to make a difference for um, for the environment around there and for the walkability uh, along industrial and just the general atmosphere. I strongly support the extended roof screen. I think it really adds to the um, good looks of the building and really does screen almost all of the roof equipment from the street. Um, I also am excited about the off-street parking structure. I never thought I'd, you know, say that out loud at a, <laughs> at a public meeting, but parking structures are really exciting, right? And you've done a good job um, making good use of the sizes of lots in our area and still um, providing the dense parking because um, surface parking is um, not an advantage to the community in my mind. 
I think the hall routes make sense. I think the hours are reasonable and the, 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 they start later in the morning along Holly Street where there are residences, makes sense to me. Um, I support reduced setbacks and other exceptions to the code and I really do like the pocket park along industrial as well. And um, I'm happy to see the shuttle program operating even before the, um, the East Side Innovation District has something broader. That's, that's a wonderful feature. Um, so I, I'm supportive of the proposal as it is, and uh, I think that's all. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. I think um, uh, I'll, I'll start with picking up on Commissioner Roof's question and his point. Um, <coughs> this is um, an opportunity to think about the um, use of recycled water for what will be, let's say, um, a cornerstone or an anchor in a new part of the development. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure if there was conversation between staff and the applicant prior um, for, I would, uh, I would very much appreciate if that were offered by the applicant to be added. Um, uh, but that's, that's a point of view. Um, and then this is a comment. I think we're going to have a lot more um, discussion around bio labs and uh, facilities. And I think w the public is asking for a little crisper understanding of what comes out. I mean, talking about chemistry coming out of stacks and um, it, it probably doesn't sit well with the people listening. Um, so. In future, I suggest, I would propose that um, as we uh, get a staff report, it would be great to hear a little bit more about what is the control, like what is the exhaust process, you know, is it incinerated on the way out, and then, you know, the right use of, the right characterization of what this exhaust is, because our community is asking for, to, to know, and I think they have the right to know what will go out. So that feels, again, like an opportunity for, for applicants. Um, if there's any comment tonight that you could add, that'd be great. And if not, I would ask that you take that away for future. Um, I, look, I think uh, I appreciate it. It's a lower building. I think it's quite attractive. I think like my fellow commissioners, um, uh, the, the parklet, uh, the landscaping, uh, the, it will be a very nice, again, anchor to that part of the development, um, capitalizing on the vision from the uh, east side plan. Um, parking, uh, CUP, grading and dirt hauling all seem with, um, within the bounds of what's reasonable. So I'm, um, other than my two objections, I'm otherwise satisfied. Um, so I guess with, with that, um, since I haven't, uh, oh, Commissioner Garvey, I see your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Just a few uh, a few comments on the project. Many of of these have been echoed already, but I want to lend my voice. One of the things I liked about this project was the the frontage area along, along Industrial Road. It looks very attractive. Really nice streetscape improvements, and I particularly liked that low wall that's added. It, it it's very not only attractive, but it's functional and it really helps form the, the edge of that park of that pocket park, which I thought was a good idea. I had two or three comments on the transportation demand management plan. Um, I really liked that double the amount of bicycle parking is going to be provided. Um, and I'm hoping that many people do choose to bicycle there from the train station uh, or from their neighborhood and that there's going to be plenty of parking. Um, and, and a nice aside is that it seems like bar the bicycles are going to be allowed uh, inside the building, which, which is also nice if, if people want to bring them in. Um, I liked the idea of the shared parking with the neighbors. I think this is a win for both uh, properties. And I think it is in line with the vision that the city has to right size parking for each uh, kind of development so that we don't 
build too little, but we don't build too much. And the fact that there's a, able to be a shared parking here um, really resonates with me. Um, and lastly, I want to echo a couple of commissioners, commissioners talked about the shuttle. I appreciate that the applicant has a shuttle and operates this shuttle and that this project will be included in the shuttle program. Um, and my last comment relates to any potential sea level rise that might be coming in the future. And I appreciate that the applicant has thought about this and is raising the floor uh, even more than the next door neighbor has already done to accommodate any future sea level rise. Uh, so for those reasons, um, I am supportive of the project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Garvey. Uh, it seems like there's a general support. Um, so do we have a, um, a motion and, I, sorry, Commissioner Roof? Could, can I ask the staff about the, the purple pipe option in that area? Is, is there existing infrastructure? It seems like previous buildings that was included, um, but I wanted to know if... Um, Oh, yeah, so there is not existing infrastructure. Um, the city of San Carlos does not have any purple pipe access or plans to connect to purple pipe. Um, we would need to figure out a way to cross Highway 101 under or over in order to do so. Um, so at this time, we just don't have a plan to do that. Okay, that, that might be something to put on your um, undoubtedly long to-do list, but it um, seems like it would Definitely be. Definitely talked about with the public works director through the East Side Vision Study, yes. Yeah, okay. In that case, I guess I'll um, uh, understand why it's not included in this plan. So I would be um, happy to make the motion. Um, I move that the Planning Commission adopt the resolution approving the mitigated negative declaration and mitigation monitoring and reporting plan for the 888 Branston Road project based on the findings and for the reasons incorporated in the initial study slash mitigated negative declaration and staff report. I further move that the planning- oh, through yes. the chair, we need to do these separately. Oh, separately, okay. Yeah. Do we have a second? I second. Commissioner Castaneda? Yes. Commissioner Roof? Yes. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Iacopone? Yes. Somebody else wanted this one. Oh. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> I further move that the Planning Commission approve the design review, conditional use permit, tree removal certificate, grading and dirt hall permit, and transportation demand management plan for the development of a new 105,416 square feet building at 888 Branston Road, APNS 046 100 060, 270, and 280, for the reasons incorporated in the staff report and with the conditions in the code compliance certificate. I'll second the motion. Commissioner Castaneda? Yes. Commissioner Roof? Yes. Commissioner Garvey? Yes. Vice Chair Clements? Yes. And Chair Iacopone? Yes. Thank you for your presentation and uh, your helping um, us understand the project um, and good luck. Thank you. Very good. We um, now have the opportunity for a study session um, on preliminary objective design standards for single family residential development types. So I believe we have a staff report. 
Good evening, Commissioners. Andrea Martisich, Assistant Community Development Director. I'll be introducing this item this evening, um, which as you mentioned, is a study session for single family residential uh, projects for objective design standards. As you may recall, the city began uh, this process last year, and just generally speaking with these objective standards, they will apply to both single family projects, which include uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and SB9 units, um, as well as multifamily and mixed use residential projects. However, the focus of this evening will be the objective design standards recommendations for single family development. And I wanted to stress before we begin, uh, for the benefit of anyone here uh, or watching, that the ideas and information presented this evening are emerging recommendations. Um, they're preliminary and by no means the final standards. We're still gathering input and feedback, uh, the purpose of which we're, we're here this evening, um, to help us finalize these. And later in the presentation, we'll also talk about uh, how to provide additional feedback, uh, which can extend past this evening as well. And that's, that's for the commission and the public. And with that, I would like to introduce Rucha Donde, our senior planner, who's also the project manager for the Odds Project. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, good evening, Chair Iacoboni and members of the Planning Commission. Rucha Dande, Senior Planner. I am the Project Manager for the City's Objective Design Standards Project. Uh, before we di dive into the details of this study session, I would like to introduce uh, the project team. That's um, Al Save, Andrea Mardusic, and Lisa Costa Sanders in advisory roles, and Megan Riddlesberger is uh, our Associate Planner, who is the Community Outreach Lead. Uh, she's leading the Community Outreach effort for this project. From uh, the consultant team, we have um, from MIG, Rishi Dori and uh, Laura Stetson, both are project managers for this project, and they will be presenting the bulk of this presentation tonight. Uh, before we uh, begin, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the San Carlos community for actively participating in the citywide survey and providing their valuable feedback that has helped us prepare these um, preliminary standards. Additionally, I would also like to thank our stakeholders and focused group members who have spent their valuable time providing comments and feedback in this ongoing process. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to Laura Stetson, who will be uh, who will proceed with the next steps of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ruja. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. It's a pleasure to be before you this evening and to have worked with your staff, who have been wonderful uh, partners, in, and as well as the community, in putting together the draft standards that we're presenting to you this evening. Just to let you know what we plan to do before I figure out your clicker here. I think we're all set. We will first talk about why the city is doing these objective design standards. We've touched on this before, but for anybody who's new to the process this evening, we wanted to provide a quick overview of that to uh, let you know what the touch points have been that started just about a year ago that, that led to the development of the, the administrative draft standards, and then present to you what those ch changes to your existing regulations are proposed to be, things that build on the standards that you have today day and then turn it back to you for any questions. So we do want to go ahead and get through the presentation and then bring it back to the, the commission for questions. But I want to plant a seed with you right now because we've got a presentation. It's 67 slides. We're going to get through it pretty fast. But while we're going through it, four key things that we want you to think about um, that we have questions at the end are to address second story step backs and setbacks and how those um, affect the design of a building. The proportion of a garage frontage, how much of a um, should the garage take up if, if that garage is on the street frontage of the building? Uh, a lot of questions about massing. How do you regulate massing in a way that's going to make a new single family residence build uh, work into the character of the community that it's in? And then also privacy is another question that we, we have for you. And how, uh, as you're building a second story, how do you ensure that there are privacy considerations for the homes that are adjacent to it? So kind of keep those four things in mind as we get through the presentation. The purpose of creating objective design standards is to put into place objective measures that can be used uh, to, to judge new single family design in the neighborhoods. And 
the reason that, um, that these are being done is because it's required by state law, a little bit of which we'll go into. Um, but through this process, it's been very important to listen to what the, what the community has to say, the people who are living with the new residential development that comes in. And as part of this process, we've asked a lot of questions about what makes San Carlos this community that it is, and the neighborhoods the way they are that bring people here and, and people um, like to talk about, you know, that it's the city of good living. What makes that city of good living in the neighborhoods that, you, that you're in? And so that's a, a lot of the, the um, questions that we've posed to the community because it's hard to talk about design if you aren't a design professional. People know what they like when they see it, but they can't describe to you all the time um, why they like it or what it is that they like or don't like. And so um, we, we've found out ways to, to ask those questions. But first of all, the objective design standards go beyond what you typically have to regulate design. It's not heights, it's setbacks, um, uh, building placement. It, it starts to touch on things like materials and roof pitch and um, the, the massing and the articulation of a building. How many trees are on a property? Where do those trees go? Is there a porch? How does that porch built? So there are things that um, are much farther than something, you know, how high is it and where is it set back from and how much front yard do you have? Objective design standards, as its title implies, or I'm gonna use the term ODS or ODS, you'll hear us say this evening, um, have to be quantifiable and measurable. The law says that they have to be that way, that two reasonable people have to look at what that standard is and agree what's being asked. And they are designed to create clarity. So if somebody sees a sign in, uh, on the property next to them that an um, addition's going on or a new building, um, they want to make sure that uh, the standards are in place that everybody knows and so there will be um, fairly predictable outcomes as to, to what's gonna happen on that site. And through the objective design standards process, the state laws were really uh, intended to streamline development applications, particularly for multifamily housing, um, because the faster it can be built, the more housing you have available to people, um, and if it, if, if, it creates the stand, if it meets the standards of the community, uh, hopefully everybody's happy. So this is an example, we, we've shared with, this, with uh, the community before, the difference between subjective and objective, and you can see on the left there that uh, um, I think Two people might be able to interpret um, what being overly busy means. What does being overly busy mean? That's something that I think if you were an attorney trying to defend that in a court of law, the, you, you might face a challenge there. And so the objective standard talks about measurement and how often something has to happen. So I think it, there you can see what the difference is between objective and subjective. And we had mentioned before that uh, the requirements for doing this come out of a numerous state laws that were passed beginning back, actually going back in time, something called the Housing Accountability Act. But more recently, the legislature has been passing laws to make, to create gr greater certainty and streamline housing approval processes. So you can see those, those bills there. And um, last year, the uh, legislature wasn't finished. They, in fact, they're, they're not finished. <laughs> They're never finished, as Commissioner Clint says, but um, there, were, there were a couple of additional laws that came in, into play earlier this year. If you have questions about them, they, they largely affect uh, multifamily housing, which we're gonna come back to you with later. Um, because objective design standards apply to all single family, well, let, let me back up. Um, under the law, it applies to multifamily and mixed use development anything over two units. But the city of San Carlos has long regulated the design of single family homes and has opted to apply objective design standards to standalone single family homes as well. So currently your, your review process as this uh, um, slide shows means you, you go through a, a process to get through either the R, R, um, RD, RC and or planning commission review for a project and it might take some time. Um, the new ODS process is designed really to create a two track system whereby if a project complies with all of the objective design standards and that determination is made by um, 
and this still hasn't been determined yet, what body is going to make that determination, then it can be approved much more quickly and not go through the, a formal public hearing process. Um, and But if there are uh, projects that choose not to comply for, for any reason, there, there'll be uh, a minor exception process. But if they just say, you know what, I don't want to put a porch on this and you're requiring me to have a porch, that's fine, you can do that, but you would go through a discretionary process instead. So it's not constraining what people might be able to do, it's just creating two tracks, do it the easy way or do it the way that create, um, takes a little bit more time and effort. So that's, that's important to keep in mind. Um, so we, we, we've talked to the community on several different occasions to say what makes good design in San Carlos for residential development? What, what characterizes those neighborhoods that you live in? And the, the first occurred just about uh, 11 months ago with a, um, a stakeholder meeting where we had one-on-one -on -one interviews with people in the development and design industry who were building in San Carlos. Then we had a workshop that was open to the entire community. We had a study session um, with you back in June of last year and staff put together a survey um, that addresses both single family and multifamily that uh, opened up just about a month ago and it, um, uh, I guess it was just last week that the, it, it closed down. You had you know, a real good number of people taking the survey. And then also as a follow up to the draft that you, the uh, working draft that you have in front of you this evening, city staff met with a, an architecture uh, group of architects and designers just to kind of do the test drive. You know, how's it looking so far? Are there things that you might want to suggest that um, there's an alternative standard for? And just to get really quickly through what this community outreach has, has resulted in, um, the, the current standards, folks have said, create kind of boxy designs, um, wedding cake approach, and that uh, regulating colors might not be something that, that uh, want to be done. So these slides show you some of the general comments that the stakeholder um, groups mentioned. With regard to... Uh, hold on here. I'm I'm being bitten by your technology bug this evening. Lisa, is it me or is it you? I don't think it's either of us, but uh, my keyboard is stuck as well. Let me just check my mouse. I think it might be a Zoom thing. Bear with us just a moment, please. I I can't do hand. Did that work? So, yeah, that works. Okay. So workshop back, well, it, uh, Lisa, I might ask you to advance for me, please. Next slide. There were several elements that were defined that uh, create char the characteristics of the San Carlos's neighborhoods, including, you know, diverse design. And so we wanted to make sure that anything that addresses architecture encourages that diverse design. Next, and Lisa, I'll get you to buzz through these fairly quickly. Um, we had an interactive uh, um, uh, design board going on while people were making comments. We were in, uh, drawing in real time what people were indicating makes the neighborhoods. People love trees in San Carlos. Next. Uh, they, they love elements that bring people towards the street, that, that lend to that sense of neighborliness, uh, be it a porch or a house that, uh, that, that the front of the house is close to the street and front yards that invite people in and out. And you know, if your neighbor's walking their dog, it's easy for them to stop by and say hi. Next. Uh, the, the porches and entrances contribute to that. and, and uh, uh, It's something that we spent a lot of time talking about because people said that was very important. Next. The side yards, make sure that the side yards are adequate to uh, create privacy and are usable space, not just you know thro throw away space. And, and the, uh, the setbacks need to make sure that there's enough room for, for or that there's uh, space for um, uh, air movement and windows so you're not creating just blank walls on the side. Next. Create buildings that aren't just blocks um, that, that don't look like the little monopoly houses. Make sure that there's there's articulation in the building. So people liked the features that do that either through step backs or uh, articulation or dormers or bay windows or other things that create some interest to all facades. Four-sided architecture, don't just do it on the front. Next. 
Um, make sure that buildings aren't just all painted one color. And uh, so do something to, to create some variety either through um, varied materials or, or not you know, necessarily requiring uh, regulation of color, but that at least maybe a building be two colors, do something to, to make it a little bit more interesting. Next. Um, we will be addressing hillside development separately, so that will come back to you as, as part of your hearing process. And on the topic of purple pipes, you, you don't have them down on the east side, and they might not be in all your single family neighborhoods, but people like the, the idea of at least um, low water use irrigation and other features that contribute to the sustainability of the environment. Next. Summary, um, as I said, you had almost 500 people responding to the summary, and survey says uh, that uh, most of the folks who did respond own a home and, and live in a single family home. So the comments that are relative to single family homes came from people who are living and um, owning those homes to a large extent. And uh, we were starting to see some similar themes from what we had heard when we had the community workshop last spring about uh, engaging with the street, uh, having a nice porch design, having a variation of, of materials and colors on a building. Um, and I particularly liked the fact that they said, you know, you need to keep that vintage San Carlos look. And, and it's hard for people to define what that is, but again, they, they, they know it when they, when they see it. I don't know if any of you took the survey, um, but there was one house that was shown, not, not in San Carlos someplace else, but had a lot of interesting colors on it and kind of vintage-y, and there was a dog sitting on the porch, and uh, a lot of the respondents said, keep the dog. So, <laughs> so that, that's not part of what we can do, but they, they, I guess we, we like dogs in this community. Next slide. Um, landscaping, similar themes, and then views. Uh, th this relates to privacy is, um, and not blocking views and maintaining privacy as well. And trees, more and more trees. Next slide. Um, as I said, staff met with architects and developers last week and got some preliminary feedback on the draft standards, and we were uh, happy to discuss with you any detailed comments that they provided. Next slide. But they, uh, as you can see, they, they were very detailed. They, um, they know what numbers mean and, and how to present the numbers, and so they, they said things like, um, rather than have standards that create what everybody terms a wedding cake look on a building um, is to you know do something like a standard setback, make it back a little bit more, and that it's a little bit more construction friendly, meaning it's easier to do. It's probably more cost effective from a construction standpoint as well. And they spent a lot of time talking about how you could ensure privacy on second story windows um, through maybe not an offset of the windows because that's hard to measure and hard to do, and it rewards the person who had their window up in the first place. Uh, but, but using some type of opaqueness standard or screen, some other form of screening to, to create that privacy that people are looking for. Next. And then just a, a couple of other, other things um, that, that uh, we're, we're mulling over and, and we'll come back to these as well. Next. So on the next slide, just to give you an overview before I turn it over to my colleague Rishi Doty uh, to go into some of the details of, of what, uh, we're, uh, what are being proposed. Next slide. The objective design standards address these topics. We're not going to go through all of these this evening. We're, we are really going to just focus on those of, uh, for which we have particular questions, those questions that I posed to you at the very beginning, um, and some that touch on some of the design components that the uh, developer uh, architect group asked about. Um, the intent is to integrate the objective design standards into your, the existing structure of the zoning code. And so we, uh, once the, the content is, has been confirmed, we'll go ahead and do that. But you can see that it touches on a lot of things. There are development standards that, are, uh, that exist today They're, that are proposed to change, but then there are also a lot of new materials um, and new topics that will be included in the objective design standards. So with that, I I will turn it over to Rishi to go through the detail on what is proposed, and uh, I'm going to keep good notes as we go get ready for your comments. Thank you, Laura. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening, planning staff. Uh, uh, Lisa, if you can go to the next slide. 
So uh, I'm going to walk through uh, some of the key design elements uh, that we have tried to convert into more objective standards. Uh, starting with the development standards, uh, we looked at the current setbacks and step back requirements. Uh, the uh, current code says that the, that the upper story may align with the lower story for up to uh, by, by four feet for up to 30 percent uh, of the length of the facade. And the feedback that we received from different stakeholders and community was that the, it was a bit difficult to understand you know how this this language is being interpreted it can be interpreted in into many ways so we did try to break out uh, we did try to clean up the language and add a measurable distance uh, that could allow you to build uh, staircases and and chimneys and and architectural elements so we are now uh, limiting that uh, uh, second story alignment with the first story to up to 16 feet uh, in length uh, Going to the uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, did come up with a recommendation uh, for the setback requirement. Uh, we are uh, providing an exception of, uh, with a design review that allows you to now set back your building to up to seven feet. This in turn allows you to align your first story and your second story on the same wall. Uh, we heard a feedback from the from the stakeholders, the architects, developers. They do want to uh, uh, have more flexibility, have make the construction more friendly. And one of this uh, one of this uh, uh, proposal will really help, you know, uh, creating those uh, construction type more friendly. Next slide, please. Uh, we then now moving into the site planning. Uh, I'm going to run through different types of site planning standards that we have developed. Uh, talking about the entry detail, uh, currently the standard uh, in uh, currently the code has uh, very objective, uh, very subjective uh, language. Uh, it does require to have a porch uh, uh, as part of a, as part of the building design element, uh, which goes up to 40 square feet in area uh, with a minimum depth of five feet. We felt this was a bit constraining for the architects and developers. We do like the idea of having a porch, but uh, limiting it to 30 square feet with a minimum depth of three feet was then allowing to have that flexibility. Uh, we did also come up with a standard for the overall height of the porch. Since we are trying to uh, bring the porches much more closer to the uh, setbacks so the building can start to engage more with the street, we are in encouraging the, the height of the overall porch to not to exceed more than 12 feet. Uh, uh, the current standard also allows you to extend your porch by three feet into your setback. We are now extending that to uh, five feet so your buildings can start to come more closer and engage with the street. Next slide, please. Uh, talking about driveways, uh, the current driveway standard that the code has is around 20 feet wide. We are uh, now trying to propose to reduce it to overall 18 feet wide. We heard from different uh, corners of, you know, uh, we, we heard from different, uh, uh, on, on, on different community engagement forums that people felt that uh, the driveways was, uh, having parked cars in the driveways were sometimes, uh, or were oftentimes creating a hazardous condition when people People were walking on the street and we felt like reducing the 18 feet driveway will still allow you to have a two car garage and in turn that additional two feet uh, will can be used as, a, as, a, as an additional landscape buffer between the adjoining uh, adjoining uh, properties next slide please uh, so talking about the landscape, we are increasing the existing standard of two feet of landscape strip next to the next to the driveways to become more five feet. We heard uh, uh, from the community a lot of times that people do want to see extra landscaping. They want to create opportunities to grow more trees. And this is one of the standard that we felt will try to solve that problem. Next slide, please. Uh, Moving to garage frontage, the current code uh, allows you to have uh, 65 feet percent of the uh, garage wall uh, as, as part of the uh, building. Uh, we are considering to reduce that to 50 feet, uh, 50 feet wide for parcels that are less than 60 feet, 60 feet or less. This will allow to create, uh, this will allow to break the overall mass of the garage facade and reduce the overall uh, length of the garage and make it more uh, appealing or make it more engaging with the street. Next slide, please. Uh, 
talking about the garage door itself, we are adding some new standards to articulate the garage door. For example, we are adding, an, uh, 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 we are proposing to have an overhang of at least 18 uh, inches in depth uh, on top of the garage door. We are also uh, proposing to have windows or, or color contrast uh, for, for the garage door so that the garage doors now start to interact more and, and make the building more appealing. Next slide, please. Uh, moving to side-loaded garage, we heard that uh, oftentimes uh, the side-loaded garages are untreated and they create long blank walls. We are proposing standards uh, that provide you different options to, to treat the, the blank uh, mass of the garage. For example, you could do it with a landscape uh, with at least 24 inches high. You could do it with raised planters. Uh, you could add more windows uh, or trellis or create a change in material. All of these are options you, you, we are proposing to provide at least one of them uh, for, to treat the overall gar uh, garage wall. Next slide, please. Uh, Moving to building design, uh, on the massing, uh, I wanted to explain a bit about the massing. So um, we, we heard a lot from the community that uh, they don't want to see boxy buildings. They don't want to see large volumes of, of building. Uh, so massing is basic. We have defined, we, we define massing as the overall building shape that in turn also provides usable space within the unit. Uh, so we are proposing to have massing standards that for that, uh, for every 25 feet, there needs to be uh, a change in, in wall plane. The current standards requests, requests uh, a change in plane for at least three feet, which may not work for the second story because the, the step back requirement is four feet. And again, it starts to make the construction more inconvenient. So we are adding, we are, we are proposing for every 25 feet, uh, there needs to be a change in wall plane or you could have a recessed entry uh, of, of, of at least three feet. Next slide, please. Or you could have a protruding window, uh, like a bay window or something. Uh, you could have, uh, you could use two distinct uh, materials, up to two, uh, and then you can also provide an upper store balcony. All of these elements will help try to break the overall mass of the building. Next slide, please. Articulation. articulation. Articulation is a layer that is added on top of the massing. It helps create the building more visually appealing, engage with the street. We are uh, requiring that for every 10 feet, there should be some form of an articulation happening on the facade, on the overall mass of the building, so, so that the, the building can be broken down. We are proposing to have an articulating element for every 10 feet. You could do it with a window, you could do it with a door, you could do it with a change in plane, but not more than one feet. Uh, and then you can also do it with change in material. Next slide, please. Uh, talking about all the other facades, uh, the previous slides talked about the facade that was facing the street. It had more stricter regulation, but when you go, when, you, when we talk about uh, facades that are facing the side property or the rear property, we are relaxing that standard to 15 feet, and uh, we have those same similar options of adding a window or doors or change in plane or change in material. Next slide, please. Uh, Another way to articulate a building is by using balconies. Currently, there are no standards uh, for, for balconies. We are proposing that there should not be any balcony uh, in your side yards. We heard from the community that privacy was one of the biggest concerns. Everyone wants to respect the privacy. So we are not proposing any balcony on the side facade. You can do a Juliet or a French balcony, but that should also not protrude more than 18 inches. Balconies, when they are facing the rear side, then it need, they need to step back at least 10 feet from the property line. That way, a minimum distance between the two balconies of, of, of two adjoining properties will be at least 20 feet. Next slide, please. Going to roof form, uh, roof forms that are facing the street, we are regulating uh, the, 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 roof, the roof form for every 13 feet, 30 feet. You have to change your height. You have to change it by a minimum of four feet. You, have, you can do it by also changing the roof form or the angle. You can also include dormers up to, up to eight feet, eight feet uh, in length. This will allow the shape of the building to be more appealing from the street side. Next slide, please. 
whereas in uh, as comparison to the all other facades we are again relaxing that to at least a length of 50 feet uh, and we are proposing the similar options of change in height for up to 4 feet a change in roof form and dormers next slide please for rooftop utilities, there are currently no standards for rooftop utilities. We are proposing that there should not be any rooftop utility that should be visible from the street. We are proposing they all should be screened. It could be, it could happen with a parapet wall. It could happen with 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 some screening materials. Uh, the intent is to not show any utilities uh, from the street. Next slide, please. Uh, talking about windows, uh, we heard privacy was one of the biggest thing item that came up again and again, and uh, window uh, alignment was something that we thought of addressing. We also got some very good feedback from the architect uh, developer group that the, with the meeting that happened last week. And as of now, we have a standard that we are proposing that for every uh, for for buildings that are close that are, the buildings that are at least 10 feet apart. Uh, they need to have a break, uh, they need to have an offset window by at least 12 inches measured from the uh, window frame. This is one of the, one, of, one standard that we have so far come up, come up with and this is one of the questions we also would like to pose today and maybe have more discussion. But there were some good standards that uh, the developers also brought us, br brought up in the last meeting and we are taking a, reviewing those, uh, those ideas. Next slide please. Uh, talking about materials, uh, currently the, the code has uh, a very subjective language that, allow, allow, that requires you to have a long-term durability and appearance which cannot be measured. We are saying that a building design should have at least two materials or at, and at least two finishes. Two materials could be, for example, uh, a, a wooden siding or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a stone and finishes could be whether it could be a paint, it could be a stucco. But you need to have at least two materials and two finishes so that the building starts to look more appealing. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also requiring to have a veins coating uh, up to uh, it, on the ground floor from 18 to 36 inches, uh, and then it, if a veins coating is provided, it should also wrap around the building up to 18 inches, uh, so that again uh, the ground floor facade uh, will will become more appealing uh, from from the pedestrian point of view. Next slide, please. Uh, Going into the uh, other details, we'll, we're going to be talking about landscaping and, and utilities uh, in this segment. Uh, for front yard landscaping, uh, there is an existing code standard which allows you to have at least 50% of paving in the in the uh, in the in the yard. We are uh, trying to keep that same standard, but we are trying. We did try to refine the language a little bit more. We are encouraging to have hardscape coverage, not to exceed 50%, and at the same time, we are also requiring to have at least 50% of more la la natural landscape so that there is there is there is more opportunity for the water to go underneath uh, the earth surface uh, and you can do it with different materials different pervious surfaces next slide please for uh, trees we heard uh, in, in, in our every engagement forum that people want to see more and more trees. As of now, in the uh, in chapter 18.18.070 trees, uh, there are standards for, for the uh, number of trees a lot should provide. Currently, it says that they should be a one, they should, the lot should provide at least one tree for every thousand square feet. We are trying to uh, stick to that same standard but add more objectivity to it in terms of the overall size and in terms of the overall height of the tree so that if a tree is planted it provides shade and comfort not to, and privacy so that it's it's helping the uh, residential unit also at the same time providing comfort to pedestrians so we are proposing a minimum of 15 feet wide canopy with a, at least a minimum 15 feet uh, uh, height this will still allow you to have a wide variety of trees uh, of as, as options to be planted uh, next slide please uh, talking about utilities 
we are including standards that will help uh, screen the utilities. We are, we, are, we are proposing there should not be any ground level utilities that is associated with the building uh, to be located in, front, in your front yard. And if any public utility uh, happens in your front yard, it needs to be screened. And it can be screened with, uh, we have proposed different approaches of how it can be screened. It can, you, you, you can use landscaping, you can use raised planters, to 12 inches high, you could do it with the vertical vegetation or walls or fencing. Next slide, please. With that, I'm going to pass it back to Laura to have a discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Mr. Chairman, uh, what we'd like to do is to pose those four questions to you again, but we are at your pleasure. Um, to cover anything else you'd like to with questions um, or discussion this evening, but they, there are four key things that staff would like some feedback on. And Lisa, if you could go to the next slide. We'll go one by one through these, um, unless you have another way you'd like to proceed this evening. Uh, Laura, thank you very much. I want to just check with staff. Um, we are going to want to bring in public comment, yes? And so um, I was just wondering, is there a, um, do you have a preference as to when we do that? It, f it feels like having the public's thoughts in would be good so that we can then take that into consideration when we have conversation. Staff would agree. Okay, good. What I'd like to do then, if we could just leave the questions up here, we, we can read them for the benefit of the public if okay. you like, but rather than go one, and then comment to comment if we could perhaps just get a couple of comment on everything that's been presented with these questions in mind, if that would be acceptable. Well, that's great. I think, um, you know, the, the members of the public who will want to comment, um, they're going to share what's on their mind and uh, they may or may not address the four questions, but um, you've asked us and so we'll make sure that we do that when it comes to our our period, okay? Okay, good. I'll, we'll sit back and listen for a while. Okay, very good. And through the chair, so that we can leave this slide up on the screen, we are going to set a timer. Andrea will be, Andrea and I will be working together and you'll probably hear it go off okay. and we can notify the speaker. Thank you very much. Um, Lynette, uh, let's go to callers and um, ask those who are, um, uh, participating tonight who would like to comment on these objective design standards to do so. Um, and um, as mentioned, uh, Andrea is going to be keeping our two minute timer. So our first caller, please, Lynette. First caller is Gary and Debbie. Very good. Hello, this is Debbie tonight. Thank you. And I just want to say thanks so much to the city and Andrea Martisich for the great presentations and the community involvement that you invited. Uh, one thing about Car San Carlos that is just great is that there's a lot of outreach and there's a lot of responsiveness. So thank you for that. This is an area where it's a little bit confusing. So I would ask the planners to uh, use your expertise to look at that and help us. The city, uh, the members of the community, we like the wedding cake sort of style of setbacks. And it seems like the feedback from the architects is sort of the opposite of what the community asked for. It looks like there's more boxy buildings with like rooftops or things like that that make it look less boxy. So if, if you would help us in trying to guide them on what would look attractive, that would be helpful. And with regard to the width of the garage, uh, doors going from 20 to 18 inch to 18 feet that can really pose a problem for seniors if you have to get out a wheelchair or something like that if you've got two cars in the garage or if you've got children and you need to get your kids out so if planners could give your advice on whether or not that's workable i greatly appreciate that thank you very much thank you for sharing your comments debbie um Lynette, our next caller. Next caller is David. Good evening, David. Welcome to uh, to our session this evening. Um, you have two minutes. <clears throat> Hello, my name is David Tusman, resident of San Carlos. I attended a few of these workshops. Um, 
And I want to uh, reiterate that these this project of the design standards is meant to streamline the process of uh, applying to get a permit for housing. Um, and so with that, I think it's really important not only to see what the prior code said on each topic, but maybe to even get examples of instances of way, like, especially for places where the code didn't mention things like those are the real problems where it's, it's super discretionary and not transparent at the beginning of the process of how the determination will go. And so I, I think it'd be important to understand what of those uh, new codes are really closing the gaps that would often rat hole the process and extend it and increase timelines and cost. Um, and then on, on another note, um, just thing about that garage door uh, shrinking, I, I, I was happy to see that. And, you know, there's a note about uh, trying to encourage increasing sustainability. Um, having fewer cars is much more sustainable for our environment. And so I'm okay with making it a bit less convenient or, or easy to just default to having two cars. Um, so th those are my topics. Thank you for thank you for taking comment. Thank you for joining tonight, David, and your comments. Uh, Lynette, our next caller, please. Next caller is Sonia. Good evening, Sonia. Welcome to our study session. Uh, you have two minutes, please. Oh, she just dropped her hand. Yes. Okay. Let's see if she comes back. At, uh, at next caller. Oh, yes, yeah, she's back now. Oh, very good. Sonia, Hi, thank you for taking... Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. For, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I appreciate this uh, process, and uh, I love uh, Attractive San Carlos. I agree on the... Uh, I like the wedding cake design, sorry. Um, but uh, my major concern is this driveway issue. Um, I, David Tusman and I totally agree on... We're at, at purpose, same, same uh, concern about increasing sustainability and um, encouraging alternative modes of transportation. Um, I would just say that my big concern is that uh, whatever vehicles people have, they need to be able to park them on their own personal property. They cannot be parking them um, or intending to park them on the street or minimizing their driveway, uh, driveway length so that they can park a car on the street. Um, I would... Um, encourage landscaping and design to, you know, grow or shrink according to how many vehicles this, whoever lives there is, is hoping to have um, so that they can accommodate them. And I don't think we should shrink that. Um, I think right now people are, you know, many still have two vehicles and I, I think one is a far better way to go, but I, you know, I can't, I can't project that onto anyone else. Um, however, if, if you have two vehicles, they need to be able to fit on your property. Um, so that landscaping strip going from two feet to five feet, um, that's fine as long as that landscaping, no, actually, I, that needs to be a permeable surface, something that's kind of half hardscape, half soft, that somebody could park a third vehicle if they needed to on there. And it's possible that, you know, this is something that when you go to the bike ped master plan, you can look and see the streets that are you know, safe routes to school or that are projected to be bike, you know, that you have a different standard for the ones that are going to be bike ways um, that need to have room for bike lanes. Um, the standard could be different than it is for streets where that is not as much of an issue where people are not, um, where the, the main thoroughfares for bikes are not happening. Um, thank you, Sonia. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your comments this evening. Um, Lynette, our next caller. There are no more callers at this moment. Okay, very good. Um, I'll entertain a motion to, no, no, no it's, need to. It's a to. study session, so okay. there's, there's no need at this time, but okay. thank you. Good, thank you for helping. 
So, Laura, um, you'd like to, uh, and we'd like to, I'm sure there's questions um, that all my colleagues have. I know I've jotted some down, so we, maybe if we could do some questions and then we can come back to your questions, would you, that'd be all right? That, that'd be fine. Okay, very good. So, uh, let's see, I think, um, Commissioner Garvey, you're still with us. I see your hand um, raised. So, um, if you'd like to maybe start with a, a question or two, then we right. can rotate through here. Um, until the team is satisfied. That sounds good. Thank you, Chair. A, a couple of general questions, and then I, I'll loop back later under each of these different headings with, with some additional questions. Uh, first, I, I wanted to um, get a little bit more detail uh, on the architectural and designer review that you went, you had a meeting, I think it was in March, uh, as someone who's been involved with the Residential Design Review Committee for a year or two, there are um, and the architects just bring a huge and valuable uh, professional perspective to this issue. And I know you met with a team of them. I'm curious, were these architects who have worked in San Carlos and uh, maybe even more than one once? I know a number of the architects come back a time and time again to the Residential Design Review Committee. And I was just curious if you uh, tapped for review of this pack packet, some of those architects who've worked in San Carlos. Thank you, Chair Garvey. Uh, I will take that um, question. So staff met with uh, six of the uh, peer architects or the architects uh, staff work um, uh, for residential additions and new homes um, commonly. And we received a great feedback and input with them. It was a one and a half hour long meeting. And the, the four questions that you see before you tonight, those were the questions we posed with the architects as well. Um, if we go back to the slide, I can um, uh, mention, it's, it's in the beginning of the presentation, so uh, I can actually go. If this clicker works, it doesn't, yeah. So it's on the summary slide for the focused group. After that, <clears throat> it's after, uh, it's later on. Yeah, after this. After this, one more, yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, for the second story projections, uh, we um, showed them what the current requirement is and then also introduced the exception requirement. And uh, the architect group did provide us some uh, really good feedback on mentioning that uh, the second story setback requirement should be measured from the uh, property line and not from the neighbor's property um, or the neighbor's footprint. And uh, that was uh, just to make sure that the 10 feet setback um, can be met very easily because of uh, because of measuring it from the neighbor's property because our second story setback is nine feet already. So uh, those kind of detailed comments were received from them and we are working on incorporating that, although for today's recommendations, we have not incorporated all of those because the meeting was just last week. However, we are uh, reviewing their feedback one by one and we'll be trying to incorporate that in the next round of recommendation. In terms of uh, second Second story windows, uh, we did talk about uh, requiring, uh, how, how do we uh, address the second story window requirement because those are the co comments we have been hearing a lot during all of our RDRC meetings. And uh, some interesting facts or interesting you know, approaches that they presented were um, having a glazing requirement or a glazing standard for that facade which is which seemed to be problematic or seemed to be um, receiving a lot of uh, public comment. So having that kind of glazing requirement um, or percentage of glazing requirement could be uh, one of those um, solutions to address the um, second story uh, privacy concerns and uh, from the windows. Then uh, another feedback that we received was um, not having this requirement at all because there is no way to, you know, um, uh, 
not, um, th there's no way to curtail uh, the view from the second story to the uh, neighbor's property. It doesn't matter if it is a uh, 12 feet or 10 feet uh, away from the neighbor's property or the side or, or the setback. So there was another discussion on not having this requirement at all if you're not able to uh, really address it uh, through the requirement. And the next slide, right. please. Yeah. Next slide, please. And then we did ta talk about massing and articulation and garage frontage. They were receptive of the garage frontage articulation requirement for both the front-loaded and the side-loaded garages, because at this moment, we do not have requirements for uh, designing uh, the front-loaded garage or the side-loaded garages. It's just the percentage requirement, how much a garage can uh, cover the front facade. So having those, um, you know, prescriptive um, options available uh, for public, uh, for applicants to, um, you know, address uh, the garage facade requirement is, uh, they were receptive of that. And regarding massing and articulation, um, when we presented to them, we did receive some feedback that we could incorporate additional uh, design articulation options such as adding shutters. Um, that could be another option uh, in addition to what we had already uh, presented. And also, um, they were not very receptive of the material break requirement because they thought that could, like applicants could slap on the materials and just say that you know it is articulated. So maybe a little bit more detail on that. So uh, that is the overview of what we heard uh, from the architect group. Uh, again, those um, comments have not been in incorporated completely in the recommendations that you see today, uh, but we are working on um, trying to incorporate that in the next iteration. Thank you. Thank you, Rusha, for that information. Very helpful. Um, and then my last comment, I'll loop back to our first of four categories that you wanted feedback on, and the first one I believe was second story setbacks. Um, one of the things we hear quite a lot of at the Residential Design Review Committee is this new two-story house looks like a box. This new two-story house looks too big. And my sense is that the articulation and the setback proposals that staff is proposing go a long way towards addressing this. And it's hard, I think, to do, to require more setbacks because many of the lots in San Carlos are so small. So I think the amount of setback that is proposed and was reviewed by the architects to me seems reasonable and, and I support that. And I'll have other questions as we loop back around, but thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Garvey. Um, so, colleagues, uh, who's up? Vice Chair? Thanks, Chair. Um, actually, if you could go back to the architects. <laughs> Sorry, Lisa, she's all over the... Um, I see uh, several things, actually, that differ from the proposed standards. So, um, yeah, thank you. I was wondering maybe if somebody could help me identify them. Maybe the second slide I saw more. But the second story, actually go back one. The second story windows, the 10 foot difference, distance for second stories, um, is that referring to the offset between window from one house and window to the other? No, that's question, yes. Oh, that's right. Sorry, it's what? Uh, 10 feet is the distance between the two facades of the adjoining property. Oh, I see. And the recommendation was how to measure that. That makes sense. The recommendation is to do it offset by 12 inches. Thank you. But I see the comment here that offset windows can pr prove tr structurally challenging. And so how would you propose to marry those two concepts? Because it was a clear standard, it looked like, in the, in the draft. 
Yeah, that was one of the recommendations. So again, we have not um, vetted this entire, um, these comments from architects uh, group because it happened last week. So uh, we will be uh, working on, you know, revising these recommendations based on some uh, recommendations. So um, yeah, we will take that comment into consideration. And uh, for the first, uh, for the previous comment that you provided, the 10 feet distance. So uh, that comment came uh, because we had a recommendation that when a window is within 10 feet from the neighboring property, it has to be in a certain way. And it, those were the X, Y, Z recommendations. However, the um, uh, architect group said that 10 feet is very easy to meet because we already have a nine feet setback, plus um, the neighboring property has to be minimum five feet. So that is 14 feet is right. easily um, reachable. So again, we will take that into consideration um, while uh, providing recommendations. Could you go to the next slide? And through the chair, could I just add to that um, as well? I uh, just wanted to point out, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we do have some flexibility in how these standards are created, meaning it could be that, um, you know, an architect or homeowner has three options to choose from and they pick one. So it could be, you know, offsetting the windows or it could be, um, you know, doing some other measure or it could be that they ha there's an exception process to not do that and then they mm -hmm. go to pub to public hearing. So there is some flexibility in, in kind of how these are designed. Um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. Thanks. Um, and on this slide, the difference with the architect's comments, the 10 feet looks difficult, the materials break might not be working. I like the shutters ad. But I mean, to me, they look, um, it looks difficult to integrate them, potentially, um, because they seem kind of the opposite of what the proposals are. And roof overhang or no roof overhang, they were like, no. And we, you know, the draft had said yes. So, um, so again, I don't know how you're gonna marry some of these. Uh, any other ideas about which way you might be going on some of these issues? Regarding roof overhang, we, uh, you know, we decided to uh, have this as an option. Uh, with other options as well. Previously, we were, you know, thinking about having roof overhang as a requirement because it provides good massing and uh, shadow effect and looks good uh, when there is a roof overhang. But uh, we also recognize that all architectural styles cannot incorporate a roof overhang. So uh, we could have that as an option um, to choose from for a garage frontage articulation. Thank you. Um, Chair, if it's okay, I have another question, which I didn't see addressed in the standards. Um, I think at the last study session, I had brought up the concept that depending on the architectural style of the home, like for a Mediterranean, uh, a porch may or may not be as contextual as um, a patio with some kind of recessed entryway, but I, I didn't see any references to uh, alternatives to porches, if you will. I apologize, I actually missed uh, speaking to that point. So we do have standard for porch, but in case if, if a developer does not want to do a porch, we have an option to have a recessed entry of at least three feet in depth. Oh. And three feet in depth is just to provide that weather protection and a, and a clear mm -hmm. landing area. So we okay. have that as an alternative. And I that's an alternative, and you wouldn't have to go through the RDRC just to take advantage of an alternative. Yes. Got it. I apologize, I forgot about no, that. No, that's fine. And then I had one other general question, which is going to be hard to answer potentially. Um, we know housing is very expensive in general. And my concern with this exercise is that it drives to the maximum, you know, of what everyone would like, like the perfect home kind of dream and conversation. And um, my concern is that some of these features are going to increase costs. And I was wondering if, um, if our architect friends could advise whether there were some that were more likely than others to increase costs. Um, some may not be much of an increase in costs, but if you could comment on some of the proposed changes. One thing that we wanted to make sure that it works into this is that there, there aren't absolute dictates for everything, but that there are options. Um, for example, for articulation, you can do one of these things and it gives the, the architect the opportunity to make an, an interesting looking building, but choose those that meet the client's budget as well, so that, that was part of the calculus behind providing those options. Um, and not trying to over-regulate. 
um, everything. So, uh, but to, to your question, um, I think we'd have to go back and ask what, what adds costs. I think the key thing that does add cost and complications, and Rishi, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, is doing a wedding cake type approach because you're losing square footage and you're having to offset building it. Um, the architects really like the idea of why don't you just allow us to push the entire building back and have the, the floors line up, but you know, you're gonna have some movement this way where you're requiring other things to break up the massing and, and make it more interesting. So I think that's a big step forward is to um, allow somebody to, to, to have that choice. And through the chair, if I could also add just on the logistics side, um, we're anticipating that you know adoption of these standards would lead to less cost for, for the planning review side because we're not going through as much um, as much review and, and hearings possibly, um, and also just time, um, the time it takes to, to get through to permitting, which you know maybe is not an, an equal offset to the cost of the new the new features, um, but we are hoping that will also help as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Castaneda, you want to chime in? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm also somewhat concerned about um, <laughs> costs, and I, I see the possibility here of decreasing the length of the process, but I'm not so sure what, that whether it'll decrease the uh, cost of the projects, especially for people who have more modern designs, it seems to me that they're the ones that are going to have to go through all these deviations. Uh, you see many designs today that have um, modern designs that use very interesting materials and create rather long facades that are really quite lovely, and yet you're requiring some kind of articulation here, possibly every 10 feet. So would that be something someone would, ha would have to seek a deviation for if they wanted to in increase that? Then they'd have to go through the deviation process. Is that correct? Yeah. And, um, and sorry, through the chair, if I could just add, could you maybe define a bit about articulation too? It's not necessarily the walls moving. But. So as I uh, did try to explain this earlier, we have two types of uh, standards. One is for the overall massing, and one, the other one is the articulation. A massing is moving the wall plane substantially, but still allowing to create usable space within the within the unit. Whereas articulation is now working on that overall mass and and beautifying it, or you know, putting more uh, uh, fenestrations or windows or doors to create a character of that mass. So having articulation helps break down the overall mass, and we do also have standards for the overall massing. No, I think I do understand that, but I think I'm seeing buildings that have still, uh, would not have a design that would allow for articulation every every 10 feet of, of some other feature. I think it would be, it would interfere with um, mm -hmm. modern design standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. I concur. And um, let's see, I know I had another question too. And yeah, as far as the, as the porches, again, that's a, that's a problem also, I think, maybe with modern designs. I think the recess would help, um, but again, perhaps a 12 foot I think I understood your reasons why you, you said 12 feet, because it can be closer to the street. But there could be some designs where 12 feet would not be sufficient, and they would, they would want to have it higher and, and a more modern design. So then they would be, have to go into the deviation process. Um, and then on the... There was a there's a section also I think on um, on the yeah the garages that you're that you're talking about, and um, I th I see that we've got kind of a conflict over whether we should reduce the size of the garages that are facing the street or not. We do, you know reduce the width of those. Um, that's an issue, but I also was uh, very curious about the requirement for 
uh, windows in some of these garages. I mean, I, I sort of consider that a safety issue. I mean, I don't, people can be breaking into these windows. And, and actually that's a, um, an option. The, the intent of the standard is to avoid a blank garage, mm -hmm. but to do something to create some texture either through windows or a contrasting color or contrasting materials to the, the building itself. Okay. And then I, I guess I sort of agree with the architects that the overhang, I, I would think also a recess could work there and I wouldn't see a necessity for an overhang. It seems to give it a kind of busy look. Uh, can, I, can I come back to a sec on the, the garage question? Because the key garage question, and um, the, I think there are two. It's the driveway width at 18 feet was one suggested standard, but then there's the whole question of how much of the frontage should a garage be allowed to occupy if it's integral to the to the building? That's that's a critical question we're looking um, to address this evening. Thank you. So I, I'll stop for now and probably have some more later. Um, thank you, Commissioner. And I know Commissioner Roof has been uh, uh, would like to get his hand in here. So please go ahead. On the window alignment offset. Um, I'm a little concerned with having um, strict uh, strict rules there because, uh, well, partly out of fairness in that why does the first house get to have their windows wherever they want and the second house has to then accommodate. Um, and also because I can imagine it, it's pretty constraining for the uh, design uh, of, of how the room layout is on the inside uh, to force the windows to, to be in a particular arrangement. So, um, I hope the rules aren't overly restrictive there. I think with the current code, there isn't um, alignment of window rules that have to be followed. Often at the RDRC, there'll be compromises brokered informally, but um, but it's not a, a hard, fast thing. Um, next comment, um, the articulation. It, one of the questions was uh, 15 or 25 feet. I, I would think 25 feet because for me the visually whether it's um, that extra 10 foot of different distance isn't gonna you're still gonna get the desired effect even with a 25 foot uh, distance in my opinion so and it gives more flexibility again more flexibility uh, for the designing uh, one not on your four questions but I not having these ground level utilities um, I've noticed on some of the new buildings there's these giant um, electrical panels with the meter poking out uh, front facing. And I think that's a utility company requirement, but I really hate it. So if that can be uh, somehow avoided um, going forward, that would be great. I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks, uh, Commissioner Roof. Uh, I'm gonna try a couple things quickly. Um, I actually like the flexibility of the front porch. I like the idea of a porch. I also like the idea of not a porch and the proposal that you've offered because I think uh, to Commissioner Castaneda's point, um, you know, not all architectural styles will bear or want that porch. Um, I actually like the way you proposed the roof line change for you know hip roofs i think that will create interest visual interest and uh, that will be welcome um i'm with the other commissioners that um and having done just a couple of rdrc meetings this um this wind side window issue is one of the more contentious ones whether it is a higher sill whether it is um you know, shade, uh, you know, frosted glazing. Um, I, I'm not sure what are the other options that have been proven to be acceptable, but um, maybe back to Commissioner Roof's point, trolling through what the compromises have been in San Carlos that have worked for neighbors might open up the aperture on the options that an architect could choose from. So just a suggestion there. 
Um, and then the, the, I think the last comment, and I know you want, also want to get to your questions. Um, did, did we discuss, did you discuss a requirement for undergrounding utilities rather than overhead utilities? Or maybe it's in there and I missed it. Um, no, uh, th there was no requirement for undergrounding of, of utilities. It, it is certainly a preferred method, um, but, uh, and Rishi, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think the, it, the statement is that above ground utilities cannot be located within a required front yard area. That doesn't mean that you couldn't put them in the parkway, but if you're putting them in the parkway, um, that they, there needs to be some treatment of them there. The utility companies are the toughest ones to deal with. They'll tell you exactly where they have to put them and no, you can't screen them. We, you know, they need to get access to them at all times. Um, I think this is gonna be an even more significant issue when we get to the multifamily and mixed use. Um, single family, usually not so much of a big deal because you're not having the big fire equipment like you have to have for, for multifamily housing. Um, but the, the, the goal is not to have the utility equipment taking up usable open space area. Yeah, and I, and maybe just to build, th so thank you for that r response. And I think, you know, specifically cable and electric, um, the world, even in San Carlos, there's a lot of that. So for the utility companies to say they can't do it, well, they've done it, so I don't believe it. So, and through the chair, if I could just clarify, um, so as part of the proposal this evening, we're not proposing any changes to that. However, the current code does require all new homes, single family homes to underground their electric, um, gas, obviously cable. Um, additions do not currently have to do that. So it's really new homes that are the trigger for undergrounding. Um, there is an exception process if PG&E provides a letter saying that it's not feasible, um, then the director can waive that requirement, um, but that does not happen that often. Good, thank you very Thanks. much. Um, and, and I actually, I didn't say the right thing. I did have one more comment. The, um, the seven foot setback variant of you get a whole, you get a 60 foot run with two stories all flat. I, I get why um, it's cost effective and easier for architecture, architects and two feet to create what is a big plane, 28, well, I don't know what the eve is, 18 foot high and 50 or 60 foot long feels much. So like, uh, is there a, a way to reimagine that particular requirement to get some variation on that one plane on a, on a long, high side yard. If I can answer to that question. So we have massing standards, so that's where a 25-foot regulation will come into play where you will have to provide a four-feet change in plane to happen or a protruding window, something like that, to break the overall long length. Even bubble. with the seven-foot setback yes. rule up. I missed that. Good. Thank you. Um, maybe just one more go round, um, and I again, I know you were asking for input on the four points, and I'd like to be responsive to that, but maybe Commissioner Garvey, uh, did you have a, a follow-up? Thank you, Chair. I had two issues I wanted to touch on. One was, the first one was the garage, uh, and I saw the uh, proposal to allow, for, or to require an 18-foot wide driveway. I'd be supportive of that if two cars can pretty comfortably park on an 18 foot driveway. And I, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't, I haven't measured it. Um, I do like the idea of getting as many cars off the street as possible for bicycles and, and other things. So if that's a possibility, then I'm supportive of it. If 18 feet means you really only can park one car, then I'm, I'm less supportive of it. My second comment with garages relates to the overhang which is I think one of the options that you can have is, a, is an overhang over the garage. I've been on the RDRC a year and a half, maybe a little bit longer. I have never seen anyone propose an overhang over a garage. Um, so it's unusual, I think, but it is only an option and I believe there were a number of options. So maybe this is an option, but I'm not sure people are really going to choose this. 
but maybe if there are articulation issues that they need to meet, maybe they will start to use it. Anyways, I just hadn't seen it and I, I, I didn't know what to say about it other than it's unusual. My last comment relates to the porch. And if a house has a porch, I'm supportive of reducing the size of that porch down to 30 square feet from, I think it's currently 40. I agree with the comment that this helps engage the house a little bit more with the street, helps possibly with articulation, and um, a large porch doesn't always lend itself to every architectural style. And I'm supportive of what uh, Commissioner Castaneda and others uh, and, and Vice Chair Clements have said about allowing for um, no porch or a, a recessed porch by, I think it was three feet for certain architectural styles. I also think that's a good idea. And those are my comments. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Castaneda, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I do, and um, I agree with Commissioner uh, Garvey on the um, driveway width being able to support two cars. I would also like to see the uh, cars off the streets. And I wanted some clarification on, uh, I have just two more points I wanna make. Uh, clarification on this rooftop utility box and having to have screening. Um, does this, how does this apply to solar panels? Which of course have to be positioned based upon the weather. So you can't just put them any place on a rooftop. Do you have to screen them? No. Um, so really uh, that got added because we've been getting inquiries lately to have um, AC condensers oh, okay. um, on top of the roof. So it's really more for that. It would not be for, for solar at all. Okay. And then one other um, point that I wanted to make in, in the materials section, which I think is figure 20 and the comments there on page 29 of my packet, I had some questions on that because it, it seemed unclear to me about what the changes in materials uh, could be and the changes in colors. What are you counting? Um, for instance, a roof is almost always a different color than the front of a house. So does that mean you could have the front of the house be all one color and the roof would count as another? Um, does window trim count? as a change. Uh, again, I don't, five, requiring no more than five colors is fine, but it seems like you maybe are requiring um, at least two or three, and people may not really want to do that, and there may be enough difference in their window treatments and in um, the roof, for instance, to give, the, give it a nice look. You know. I can uh, quickly speak to that. So uh, that point is um, uh, taken and uh, we will um, make sure that um, the change in material is specified for what we have. We will be counting it towards. Uh, will it be for architectural features or only the planes of the, uh, of the walls? So thank you for that comment. We will definitely make sure to um, clarify that. Thank you. Vice Chair Clements. Thanks, Chair. I have to say I agree with Commissioner Castaneda on several of her comments. I think it's important that these standards support different types of architectural styles. I personally am having a hard time picturing what a Mediterranean home would look like, what a modern home would look like with these standards because the drawings are all kind of cute. I don't know if you're going to call them craftsmen, some of them, or you know what the styles are. So I don't know if that might be just a suggestion as we develop this further, what it could look like um, on other styles. It looks like you'd like to respond to that. And we wanted to be style agnostic, ab ab absolutely. Um, and so there is a reference in there that says, pick a style and stick to it. So whatever you're choosing in terms of the colors, the trim, the roof, the porch, no porch, whatever, make sure that it is of it is all of a style. And we've included two reference documents um, to use and or anything else that the city might use in the future um, as a guide for people to use because those might go out of print or whatever, but and, and you need to be keep up with the times. Um, so the bottom line is 
um, don't do something that's combining a bunch of different styles. Mm -hmm. um, right. But, but uh, to, to your point, um, uh, Commissioner Castaneda, I think you mentioned a modern house that might have very little detailing. Um, that's a good test, I think. Let's pick something. And in fact, if somebody, if one of the commissioners has a house that they'd like us to run a test case against. <laughs> <laughs> I actually pulled up a picture of one that I, that I like and that I wondered about. And um, yeah. We would oh. we would welcome that. Say, hey, hey, run this through the the, the test and see if it's going to work. Okay, thanks. I noticed mm -hmm. it does have different roof lines and projections and actually a recessed entry, although not qualifying as a porch um, because it is too small. It does not meet 30 square feet, but the entry itself is recessed by three. So, and definitely no overhang on the garage with a modern <laughs> typology. So. Um, yeah, so that's my interest, which is just making it suit d diverse styles and not being too prescriptive because I don't want to end up looking like Seaside. I left, and I left where I grew up because there were five types of homes and it was cookie cutter and I couldn't stand it. It was awful. One of the things that's nice about San Carlos is the variety. So, um, so I think the options are important. I'll say it that way. Um, per your question about garage frontage, I, this is one of my, um, yeah, this is one of my issues. Yes, I would like a smaller proportion, uh, definitely in the 65. I think 50 is kind of generous too, but I realize our lots are not that wide in many places, so it's kind of necessary, um, potentially in some places. Um, and the privacy on second stories, I, uh, you know, this might be being specific, but I think a lot of us have that challenge. Um, I have a second story, and my bathroom window looks out right onto my neighbors, which is only about 10 feet away, maybe 12. Um, and I find that rain glass, I, I think it's pretty private. Um, I don't know if my neighbors share the <laughs> share that feeling, but um, in addition to glazing, different kinds of um, of glass treatments that might be more appropriate, th that could work as well. Um, and trees here, you know, um, many of the tree types are green year round. And so I think that that is also a big help um, in, our, in our side yards. And, and other than that, I mean, there are 101 questions you could get to through this, um, but I do think that the, I don't want to have too small increments on homes um, where we know that the next, I think you had said the massing, should the wall plane be broken every 15 or 25 feet? And I'm trying to think of what my house looks like, and I actually don't think it would meet the, it's 1930 home. Um, I don't think it would meet the every 15 feet. I do think it'd meet every 25 feet, and there's a considerable, you know, step forward, step back in the building, and I, I think it looks great. Um, personally, um, and also I think it's just stucco and a really, you know, old style clay roof, but the stucco has texture enough that it doesn't look like super bland straight. So I'm not sure if two materials and two finishes, I think that was the requirement. I, I'm not sure what that would look like on some houses. So uh, those are some of my comments. Thanks. Thank you all. That was a, a real, real good um, rundown. And I, I would say I'd actually have one, just one point to make, and then maybe we can go through and um, in turn ask each of the commissioners to, if they haven't already, comment on the four questions. So that way you've got some, um, got some material. My, the, I didn't ask, there was a, uh, Rishi, you made the point about um, tree sizes and standards for tree sizes. Okay, um, when? Okay, it, uh, so is that 15 years or is that three years? Because our intent is to, to, to say at maturity, um, we will talk to our landscape architects and see if there's a better standard to use, they, they provided to us the standard of 15 at fif, uh, 15 high, 15 uh, breadth. Um, but Rishi, you actually talked yes. to me. I'm sorry. Uh, so we, we are requiring a minimum of 15 feet wide canopy with a 15 feet height. 
that is not at maturity. It can mature and become even more bigger that can again contribute to the sidewalk and additionally provide privacy to the dwelling unit. Okay, and you know, the, the obvious reason for the question is a species, maybe there are species of, maybe most species of trees that are acceptable will get to that scale in a short period of time. And if that's the case, then, you know, I'll just move on. Um, okay, all right, good. So um, if we could start with Commissioner Garvey, um, and if you could please look at the four questions, and if you haven't given feedback on, on any of them, or if you have a point of view, you could do that, and then we'll just rotate through the commissioners. Would that be okay? And then we'll have given you what you've asked for. Thank you, Chair. Uh, two two det more detailed comments, and then a, a more general closing comment. Um, I wanted to comment on the balcony uh, situation that was raised. I agree that no side yard balconies uh, should be allowed. I've, I've never seen a side yard balcony proposed in the RDRC, so I don't think this is an arduous requirement. And I liked the, uh, for the rear balconies, I liked the setback requirements that were proposed. Those seem uh, very reasonable. Um, and regarding the use of low water sustainable design in the front yard, very supportive of that. I would say that 100% of the projects that have come before the RDRC uh, in the last year and a half are uh, embracing this. So I think this is a really a no brainer. I think half of my street this past year has pulled out any grass and is um, replacing it with sustainable low water design. Um, and just in, in closing, I, I liked this uh, draft because even though it's not perfect and is still a work in progress, it it does provide, it will provide clarity to not only the homeowners, but also to the developers and the architects. And, and I think that's a good idea. Um, and it also speeds up the timeline. I, I think it was staff that said that they won't need to review things. It will move forward faster. And if staff doesn't need to review things, then that means the fees that the homeowners need to pay to the city are reduced. And I, and I like that um, as well. So those are the comments that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, can I just check, can you see the four questions on your screen? Yes, I can. Uh, do you have any further input on any one of those that you didn't get a chance to share already? I do not. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Roof. For question one, I like the idea that if a larger setback is provided, that it's okay to align with the first story. It seems like that's a good compromise. And as you have more setback, less impact. Uh, so that makes sense to me. Garage frontage as a percentage of the building also makes sense to me. For the driveway, um, having a fairly narrow impervious uh, limitation seems fine, if, especially if, if it's allowed to have a, a pervious uh, but hard uh, on the sides. It seems like a, a, both aesthetically and functionally um, allowing for that uh, seems pretty good. And, um, and um, although the, uh, the standardized design criteria make a lot of sense, we do have the second pathway of having it be an exception design review. Um, and so if something like a side balcony, I, I agree, it should not be allowed in, in the standardized process. And if somebody, if there's a situation where that would be fine, then they can bring it to the, um, through the exception review process. Um, so we can be fairly strict um, or conservative, perhaps, in my opinion, with the, with the, um, the um, ODS. Uh, because there is an alternative pathway. So it's not like we're um, being overly restrictive. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Castaneda, uh, any of these four that you didn't get a chance to comment on, or maybe all of them? Um, I think so. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Uh, the setbacks and the second story step backs. I, I think you've got a good compromise on those. And um, again, I'll, I agree with Commissioner Root on <clears throat> the seven foot, then allowing um, 
them not to be set back. I think that's a, that's a compromise that works. On the garage frontage, I'm for decreasing the garage frontage, but I don't want to decrease it to the point that you, you're going to end up with a driveway where you can't park two cars. Um, the massing, I think I addressed that. I don't think that in all cases it's going to be necessary um, or desirable to have to break up the wall pane every um, 15 feet, maybe the 25. And the privacy on the second stories, I mean, offsetting the windows will certainly work in some circumstances, but it, I don't think it's going to work in all circumstances. So I, I think maybe we need to work on that a, a little bit more. And the landscape screening would, in fact, help. OK. Great, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Clements, uh, are, are there any of these four that you didn't get a chance to speak to? I'm fine with number one. Um, as my colleague said, I, I think if it's further from the street, I think it's less of a uh, an impact, especially if it has other um, uh, features to the to the wall. Some kinds of I don't know if fenestrations is the right word. I don't know if I'm using it correctly. Um, I think I addressed the other three, and I do want to um, actually comment on the driveway and garage, which I think is only in orange text, but it is um, something that I don't understand and not really um, in favor of. The figure nine driveway and garage with a five-foot landscaping strip to the side of the, of the driveway between that and the lot line that it is, I'm reading it as required. And I don't understand why. So I would, um, I, I don't know that that's some, I think that's more of a comment than a question. So that would not, I am not understanding the need for that. Um, and finally, I just I wanna say, it sounds to me like the 18 foot wide driveway will fit two cars close together, side by side. and. And I, I differ from my colleague and one of the callers. I absolutely think it's fine to have a home where there is a one-car garage and there are two cars in the garage. The public streets are meant to be parked on. They are public streets. So the idea that we would not have parking on the public streets by design does not make any sense to me. I disagree with that hardly. That's it. Thanks. Thanks, Vice Chair. Uh, Setbacks and second story, um, Rishi, with your comment about the articulation, the mass, I support what you've proposed. I think that's good. Um, I'm going to skip garage for just a second. Massing, uh, you know, I, I think whether it's 15 or 25 feet, um, uh, my suggestion is take the, the guidance from the architect because um, I, I don't know what, I can't imagine what design constraint that would do. My preference is every 15, I would say, but um, I don't want to codify something that's, you know, physically dumb. And I, I'm just not smart enough to know. Um, I think that all of my colleagues have spoken uh, well on the privacy on second stories. I mean, again, this is one of the hottest points. It's the, often it's bathroom across bedroom or bedroom across from kitchen and, um, oh, well, I guess not on the second floor. Um, and having optionality and my suggestion to learn from what's worked in the past, that's, that's what I would add there. And I, I think um, I, I'm, uh, with regard to garages, I think um, first, we have a lot of families that have multiple children or have a couple of large vehicles. And um, it, the idea of telling people, sorry, you can't do that. Uh, you, c you need to have 18 feet wide driveway and you have to squeeze kids in and out and you've got to bang doors against doors. Just like, it just doesn't seem, it wouldn't be what I would recommend. Um, and point one, I think point two, your recommendation to have pervious 
drive for 50% or more. And we have a lot of that in the city and it really softens the look of concrete. So a, um, a 20 foot wide drive or an 18 foot wide drive with grass growing in it, like it just, it, it seems, um, again, I would not reduce that for my, for my logic, my thought process. Um, and you had asked about whether it's 65% or 50%. Or 50 I, I think um, I like the idea of less, despite what I said about tight garages and big vehicles. And I wouldn't want that 50% less to, you know, really inhibit um, people, kids, families, comfort, elderly people comfortably getting in and out of vehicles when two cars are parked side by side in the garage. That, that just wouldn't be friendly to my, to my way of thinking. Okay, I think we've been through all, all of us and I think we've, have you gotten your, um, your feedback? Good? Uh, uh, sure. The hour is late, so I'll make it fast. Um, I believe the, impo the, in the purpose of this law is to make it very clear to everybody how to just get approved. I would suggest that the city establish a process where staff will be approving um, uh, and that no other body need to approve. Maybe it's the director of community development for some exceptions or some interpretations. Um, but I think that we should design these ODS, ODSs um, in a way that we expect 80% of the traffic to go through this route and to the extent that there are options in here, I think that that's important. I think it should be a really rare occurrence when somebody hopefully um, asks for a waiver to the set of objective standards. So I know that makes it maybe a bigger task. Um, but I do. Th I also think, by the way, our fee schedule should probably um, reflect our preference that folks not, you know, uh, just say, "Let's do a Juliet balcony 19 inches deep," and you know, like to go through this other process. I think our fee schedule should steer people towards the standard process. Thank you. I, I think. Um, well, let me just check. Did. Uh, did you get the feedback that you needed for this evening? I have another piece um, that I needed to uh, give an update on, and that's for the SB9 units, or we are calling them the infill units now, um, and the next steps associated with it. So in November 2022, that's uh, later last year, uh, when uh, the SB9 urgency ordinance was extended for another year, the city council gave staff direction to um, check or research the feasibility of increasing the um, infill unit um, size from um, more than 800 square feet, that is the state mandated um, requirement. So um, uh, in the, uh, with this project, the single family objective design standard, staff is also working on researching how other cities are addressing this um, SB9 unit lots um, uh, square footage requirement. And um, we have received some uh, good um, research uh, input from different cities and we are working on providing and crafting recommendations um, to potentially increase the size of uh, these SB9 units both for uh, non-lot split and lot split scenarios. So um, uh, as a next step, staff will be taking forward these recommendations to the housing subcommittee and um, getting their feedback and then um, as a next step, we will be merging this with the single family objective design standards uh, project and then bringing it back to the Planning Commission uh, for um, recommendation. So with that, I also wanted to um I'll uh, get some feedback from you that uh, based on our discussion tonight, and thank you for the great comments and input, um, uh, you could um, also direct staff uh, to have another study session if um, the committee decides to uh, do that um, in order to um, uh, see or review the uh, second iterations of the single family objective design standard. So um, it is up to the committee to decide and direct staff if uh, you would like to see another study session as well. 
So that concludes my presentation, and um, back to you, Chair. Thank you, Rucha. Thank you, um, Andrea. Thank you, MIG team. Very helpful. And uh, all of you for your comments. And uh, I'm not sure if any of our three callers are still on the line, but be assured that the MIG team were taking notes with all of uh, your input too. So that was captured. Um, I think with with that now we're we're complete on item number eight. And um, item number nine, reports, correspondence, and general information. A report on recent city council actions. Thank you, Chair Iacopone. Uh Yes, there's a couple of um, just quick announcements regarding city council actions. The first being that the city council um, adopted their yearly strategic objectives. Uh, most of the ones that we've had before were readopted, and uh, what staff can do is go ahead and send out a copy to the planning commission so you have a, a clear uh, idea of what was um, adopted by the council. And then the other um, announcement, quick announcement, is that the city council reappointed um, RDRC member Hey Young Datwani for another term, so she will be on the RDRC until June 30th, 2026. And that's it. Very good, thank you. Uh, Planning and Transportation Commission comments or reports? Vice Chair Clements. Thanks, Chair. I would like to report that it is Commissioner Castaneda's birthday and that she has opted to spend it doing her public duty together with us. So I wanted everyone to be able to say happy birthday to her. Birthday. Thank you. Happy birthday. I won't sing, but happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Commissioner Garvey, I think you uh, wanted to report. Thank you, Chair. I wanted to say that I attended the Northeast specific plan workshop on March the 15th. Uh, this was well attended and was a really good workshop. I learned a lot and I'm really glad that I uh, was able to attend. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Castaneda. I also attended that workshop and it was excellent with uh, a lot of good input, very good. Um, and I was actually going to uh, chime in as well. I also attended that session. Um, I was, I would just add that I was struck by the, um, the, the passion of the business owners uh, in, in the area with their request to help them um, through our, our zoning process do what we can to protect their right their, uh, to be on those property and to protect their businesses. I, I know that um, you know the, the development will take the course that it does, but I just want to be mindful of that. And I, I think the other thing that struck me was that there was a very polar conversation around whether new how whether housing should be um, a definite feature or a definite not feature of the Northeast area. And I think. Um, it feels like an area where more work is going to have to be done by staff as you think about what your recommendation is in, the, in our future conversation. And that's all I've got. Thank you, everyone. Uh, item C, correspondence. I uh, just wanted to make a note of an additional public comment that came through on an item that was acted upon tonight, 888 Branston. This was an email from Debbie and Gary Baldaki that came in last Thursday after the packet was released at 7.14 p.m., but I believe all the commissioners were copied on that, and so you are aware. That's it. Great, thank you. And item D, planning staff comments, reports, and updates on current projects. So for this item, uh, Chair and Commissioners, um, our next meeting with the Planning and Transportation Commission will be Monday, April the 3rd. And for that particular evening, it looks like we will have one item. So in exchange for our very long meeting tonight, we will have a very, well not so very, but we'll have a shorter meeting most likely on April the 3rd. This is um, an item that involves a general plan amendment due to a discovered mapping error. error. So we do want to correct that. And I think that should be very straightforward. And then um, the second meeting in April, um, we will be bringing forward two items. One is um, an application to construct 15 units at 1383 Laurel. I believe this is a mixed use project with 15, thir 13 and 
15 units, 15 units, 15 units at 1383 Laurel Street. And then uh, following that uh, public hearing item, we will have a study session, another study session, but this time a study session on the progress of the downtown specific plan. So it's a good time for us to do a check-in with the planning commission. And we will be going to city council one week after that. So we'll be doing a study session first with the planning and transportation commission, and then also with the city council. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like there is one other item. We weren't sure, 642 quarry. A, um, Andrea, do you know the description of that? Uh, New Life Science. New Life Science, 642 quarry. Plan, plan development plan. This is an application for a plan development plan at 642 quarry. On the 17th as well. This one would be on the 17th, yes. So we'll have two public hearing items and then a study session. The other, um, the other announcement that I would like to make is just for, um, actually there's two more. One um, concerning biosafety. So the commission will absolutely recall that you um, heard this item on March 6th. So that recommendation that has been made by the commission will go forward uh, to the city council on Monday, March 27th. So they will be taking um, formal action uh, to consider the commission's recommendation. And then the last announcement for this evening is I wanted to make the public aware of two surveys that are currently active and, um, and available for community members to participate in. One um, is for the downtown specific plan. So we are um, making sure that we cast a wide net and, and all anyone who wants to comment on some of the preliminary design ideas for downtown, which concern the closure of Laurel Street, alleyways, Frank Harris, Park, the little pocket park off of the 700 block, and also ideas for a new plaza off of the 600 block. This would be the plaza located between Blue Line Pizza and um, the upcoming Paris Spaghetti. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're giving uh, folks ample time to really capture all of their input. We had a community workshop, we had an open house, and now we have this survey. Um, in addition to the downtown survey, we also have ongoing a um, survey as a follow-up to the Northeast Area Specific Plan Community Workshop. That is also available on um, the project website as well. So there's, as you can tell, a lot going on between specific plans, odds work, objective design work. Um, we have a lot, and so the community is encouraged to reach out uh, to us and let us know if they have any questions or, or feedback um, concerning these items that staff is currently working on. And those are my announcements for this evening. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, thank you, staff, uh, for helping us through this evening. Thank you, Lynette, for managing our technical difficulties behind the scenes. And with that, our meetings adjourn.